right, we are live. Hello and welcome to the SE Ranking SEO conference entitled What Shapes SEO Today and Tomorrow. Uh, your host today, it's me, yours truly, uh, Chris Rolf. I'm the, uh, the founder of a small boutique agency here in Boulder, Colorado called Boulder SEO Marketing. I'm an international SEO expert originally from Switzerland, have been in SEO, gosh, for about 25 years, connected with the good people over at SE Ranking a few years ago. They're giving my students, I also teach uh, SEO at universities, free access to SE Ranking. I'm, an, I'm now also a brand ambassador for SE Ranking, the all-in-one, hang on, all-in-wow SEO platform. Uh, it's not the only SEO tool that we use here at Boulder SEO Marketing. It, the, the platform uh, reaps in reward after reward. So definitely check them out if you haven't already. It's an amazing platform for if you're a business owner, if you want to do SEO on your own for freelance SEO professionals and for SEO agencies alike, like my shop. So definitely give them a try. Uh, we love SE Ranking. It's an incredible platform. All right. Today, we have a very packed agenda. Uh, I'm thrilled to actually be able to listen to all these uh, presentations today. I hope you'll be able to do so as well. Heads up, we're going to record the entire conference. So if you have to bolt early or watch a World Cup uh, match, boy, what a surprise today. I'm not going to spoil uh, the result, but uh, it was an interesting result uh, what happened with Argentina today. That's it. Uh, very packed agenda. Uh, we're going to listen to Sean C. Uh, as he talks about how SEO changes lives. Then uh, SEO Tro Blogs and I, we're going to chat a little about, uh, about SEO news. Then Lydia Infante uh, is going to talk about a data-driven approach to winning. Very critically important. Dan Taylor is going to talk about tackling enterprise level SEO problems. Uh, Rechoice Oyaku uh, is going to talk how to SEO optimize content briefs. Then I'll talk about uh, how you need to incorporate AI, artificial intelligence into your SEO strategy now. And then everything you need to know about Entity SEO by Sarah Taher. Uh, tracking, measuring, and improving core web vitals by Sophie Gibson. Data-driven technical SEO research by Omi Sido. And then last but not least, many of us know Barry Schwartz. Uh, it's going to be an expert Q&A. How to always be prepared for Google updates. Very packed schedule. All right. Let's... Let's talk about giveaways. Um, I encourage you, if you want to win one of our giveaways today, just publish a social media post about the uh, SEO conference. Take a screenshot, uh, quote one of our speakers today, um, overall thoughts, and then just tag SE Ranking in your social media post. We're going to give away three of those very cool hoodies right there, the top right, and then also three essential 500 subscriptions to SE Ranking, including the, the content marketing tool, the new platform that was recently released, one of my favorite tools on the platform now. So please, please, please go ahead, take advantage, uh, try to win and um, mention us on social media. All right. That being said, uh, I'm extremely excited to introduce you to you, uh, Sean C. Uh, he's our keynote speaker today. Sean is going to talk about uh, how SEO transformation, uh, about SEO transformation in the digital area and basically how SEO changes lives. Uh, that being said, Sean, why don't you uh, join us?
All right. All right. So, how's it going? Hey, Chris. Thanks so much for the intro. And that was very cool. Uh, um, the B-roll video you have right there of me. And I know. <laughs> cool, cool. So, hey, we just uh, caught up. Uh, and actually, I looked you up. I did a search for SEO Philippines. SEO hacker shows up at the very top. Hey, why don't you quickly introduce yourself very briefly? So my name is Sean, and thank you again, uh, Chris, for the intro. And thank you, SEO Ranking Team, for having me here. Really appreciate it. I'm the CEO and founder of SEO Hacker. I founded the company when I was 21 years old, almost a kick out from my school because I failed a lot, 28 units in my college. Figured that being a career guy may not be the way for me. So I started blogging about SEO after I tried learning about it. And the blog, which was called SEO Hacker, started picking up and it started getting clients. And that's how it all started. And from a $60 startup, because literally I used $60 to buy the website and domain name. Now it is a million dollar company based here in the Philippines. Wow. That's incredible. It's, it seems like, it sounds like a familiar story. I know a lot of people in the industry who can share a similar story. Really cool. Well, hey, Sean, uh, I, I think everybody is excited to, uh, to hear your speech. So why don't we get right into it? Awesome. All right. Hey, guys. Good evening. Hope you, well, it's good evening here in the Philippines, 10 p.m. Good morning to, depending where you are, or good afternoon. Again, my name is Sean, and I'll take you through the ropes. My talk is going to be search engine optimization changes lives. Now, you might think maybe this is an exaggeration of things like how is my job being an SEO guy or an SEO gal changing lives today? And we'll dive deeper into that. But before that, just want to give you a little bit more introduction about myself. So I'm a guy who has written a couple of books, CEO at 22 being my first one. Let me see if I do have a copy here. Yes, I do. Um, unfortunately, this is not distributed everywhere in the world. It's just here in the Philippines. But if you are interested, I do have the ebook in my website and I wrote 50 extra business in Amazon and how to make remote work work during the pandemic. I also have my podcast. I'm on YouTube and Spotify. I speak about leadership, entrepreneurship and management because I lead a team of 50 people here in the Philippines. And my goodness, leadership is a lot of work. So everything I'm learning, I'm sharing there for free. You can check it out if you want to learn more about stuff I do outside of the SEO realm. And SEO Hacker, of course, my first company, I founded a couple of others, which I'll not get into right now, because what we're going to be talking about is how your work and my work in SEO changes lives. Now, have you ever paused for a second and thought about it? Why did I get into SEO? Why did you guys get into SEO? There must be a reason why. And I want to share with you my story. How I got into SEO is I started a blog called Got In You. This is way back 2009. And 2009, here in the Philippines, not a lot of people knew what SEO was. If you say SEO, people are like, what? What? Did you say CEO? I mean, I, I know it's funny if you are also getting the same um, reaction before years back. But now SEO is everywhere, right? So I started during a time when SEO was not really a thing here in the Philippines. And I had a blog called God in You. I'm a born again Christian. And if you're wondering if the blog still exists, it does. You can find it in my website, sean.c slash ideas. Sean.c is my own personal website. You can find everything about me in that website, my public speaking, my investments, and so on. And so I looked at my stats and this got a new blog, which I was writing in, didn't have a lot of visitors, didn't have a lot of readers and subscribers. So I searched in Google, how do I increase my readers and subscribers? And this thing called SEO kept popping up. And I thought, why is social media marketing not here? Because Facebook was more, more popular during that time versus SEO. And I said, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and learn what this SEO is and apply it to the God and You blog. And I made it work. And there was the page rank system in the page rank toolbar before, which I was using. And I got it to page rank four. And I didn't know a lot. So I got to page rank four. I was so excited. I thought maybe I could do this for other companies. So I started as a freelancer, a one man team doing everything. I had no idea. No, I didn't know how to sell, didn't know how to market, didn't know how to manage a company, didn't know a lot of leadership stuff. So I was in leader during that time. But that was 12 years ago. Fast forward to today. We are a 50 man team. And as I mentioned, we are a million dollar company right here in the Philippines. And I still own 100% of the business. I have no investors, no partners. And we're all really just super blessed in what we do. 
and SEO has changed my life and it has changed the life of a lot of the people I work with in my company. Ever wondered what life was before search engines? Now, I was told there's around 1,600 people who signed up here. And I assume a lot of you guys tuned in are young ones, right? I'm 34. I assume a lot of you guys here are younger than me. So you probably didn't know what life was before search engines came to be. It's life's easy with search engines, right? Before, how difficult do you think it was to get a plumber or to get an electrician? Hello, here in the Philippines, it was all referrals. Hey, do you know an electrician? Hey, do you know a plumber? Hey, do you know someone who can fix my roof? There was, if there was no Google here, we'd still be asking word of mouth. And if you don't have anyone in your circle of influence who knows a good plumber, you're pretty much screwed, right? I mean, you have to go out of your way to really shop around and look for these services. How hard was it to look for the specifications of a big purchase that you're going to be doing, like a car or a laptop or a PC or a mobile phone? It would be very difficult. In fact, you would always need to go to the store just to ask for the specs and you would need to keep going back just to learn which big purchase you're going to be doing, which car you're going to go for. But a lot of things today are within a click of a button. You don't even need to go to the shop. You don't need to go to the car store. A lot of things today are within the touch of a finger, within a punch of the keyboard. It's super duper easy for a lot of people, billions of people who are connected to the internet. And knowledge is valuable. A lot of people, a lot of places say knowledge is power, knowledge is valuable. Yeah, sure, of course. But it's a lot more commonplace than it is today. In fact, we got an overload of knowledge. And a lot of this knowledge that we have is online. And a lot of it is on Wikipedia. But is it really that valuable when it's so diluted and when it's so noisy because there's a lot of things in this so-called repository of knowledge, which is the internet, that's not really true. What is increasing in value today, as I speak right now, is the truth. Because truth, by definition, is exclusive. And there are absolute truths in our world. You can't say that, ah, oh, truth is relative. What's true for you is not true for me. What's true for me is not true for you. And that's always how it's going to be. You can't say that because... We have gravity. Gravity is an absolute truth. If you say, well, gravity is not true for me, try jumping out the roof of your house and you know immediately that gravity is quite true, right? Quite absolutely true. So there are truths in this world that are exclusive, that are absolute, and we can't argue with that. And the internet is full of knowledge. Sadly, we got a lot of fake news going on. And what is important is we bring out the truth as SEO specialists. Social media is plagued with fake news. Even up to today, we ask people, do you believe what you read in social media? How much of it is valuable to you? How much of it do you think is true? And a lot of people will say, maybe 50% of it is true. I don't know, right? I don't know what to believe anymore. And we pre prevent these things. You and I, as SEO specialists, we prevent these things from happening in the world of search. We work with search engines. We follow their guidelines and best practices. We make sure that we're able to serve people along with Google, with Bing, with Yahoo, all these search engines. We make sure we serve people who are looking for information, the truth of the knowledge in the internet. We serve them. We help researchers, academics, scientists, further their research, and so further the knowledge of our species. We help hobbyists find that niche, niche product that they have been dying to purchase or they might be wanting to purchase so that they can sell it. We help businesses find the best service providers out there to help them with their growing painful problems. We help, we help patients find the right hospital, the right doctor, the right medicine, and how to admi administer that medicine or how to take that medicine, when to take that medicine, did they take it with food or not? We literally save lives. You and I, we make the world a better place. We have a very noble job. And I know that you and I don't see things this way in a lot of days. I'm sure I'm not the only one. I'm sure you guys experience this as well. 
See, the problem is we rarely see our work as a noble job. We rarely see our work as a just cause, as something worth doing. Often, we see this. The search results page. We live and breathe this. Often, we see tools like SE ranking and how is our rankings. And often, this is what we look like when our competition outranks us. <laughs> Even if it's just one or two spots, we're like face palm. This makes SEO, don't get me wrong, the competition, everything makes SEO a fun game. And you and I, we enjoy the game. That's why we keep playing. But we should never forget. We should never, ever forget that we, what we are doing matters. You see, time is the building blocks of life. And the more time that people spend out there on the shop asking about the specs of this these cars that they, they're shopping around for, the more time they spend on the shop, the computer shop, asking which laptop would be best for them, the less time that they have to spend with their family, with their loved ones, the less life that they have. And you and I, what we do is literally we save their time and so we save their life. Because time is the building blocks of life. We save thousands of lives every single day. And I'm not going to make my talk very long because I know that this is still going to be a long event. And a lot of the things that might be discussed here are more technical or it's going to be a higher knowledge for you guys. And you got a lot of learning to do. So I'm going to wrap this up and just say thank you for being a modern day hero. What you guys are doing, it is a noble job. It is a worthy cause. Thank you so much. And God bless you. If you want to email me, this is my email address. And you can follow me on Spotify, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you so much. Take care, guys. And God bless. Oh, boy. I was hoping that Sean would stay on for a second here. Um, why don't we... Oh, there we go. Woo! You're back. I'm still here. All right. Good, good, good. Very inspiring session. I uh, I agree. Um, let me take a step back here. I do think that SEO has changed dramatically. So I'm actually even a little bit older than you are. Uh, just hit 52. Uh, I got into SEO about 25 years ago when Google was still wow. called Backrub, right? So everything wow. has completely changed since then. Yeah. It's like the wild west all you had to do is like get buy backlinks and your website would show yeah. up um nowadays um like we are very uh, careful on who we work with uh, luckily yeah. we're pretty well at doing seo of our own company how do you how do you decide who you work with? Uh, like, well, what kind of advice do you have to SEO freelancers or agencies out there um, to be ethically responsible? I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. When you say who you work with, does this mean clients? Or yes. Just, just, yeah. Okay. Clients Client. and also in turn, you know, clients, employees. I mean, I know there's Got still it. people out there. They do the black hat stuff, which... Yeah. Not my gosh chris that's that's yeah. that's gonna be a long answer okay but i'll try to tr try to summarize it as much as i can yeah. for employees we are very picky with who we hire and who i let in my house so we have a long hiring process it's a seven step hiring process they go through a lot of people they answer an 80 question core value exam that i personally wrote and we really try to see if they're the right fit for our culture um, I, SEO hacker, we're very, very good with training people, even if they're new hires, even if they didn't study marketing or IT, we were, we have a lot of process videos and documents and we always tell people, don't be afraid to ask. There's no red tape, no bureaucracy. Literally my, op my office is an open door and people can just come in and ask me questions. So that's the kind of culture we have, but we're very strict with our hiring process. So with every 100 applicants, and these are all good applicants, we are able to hire somewhere at 5% per position open that we got, right? So mm -hmm. that is something that's very important for me. 
because it's not just about the skill set and how fast they learn. It's about how well they fit into the culture. And the culture, of course, is something that the founder or the CEO is has to intentionally build. So I'm very intentional about our culture and people we let in. About the clients now, how do we choose the clients we work with? One of the things that I always tell people who ask me about clients and getting clients and closing deals is not all money is good money. So we turn down SEO hacker. We're known here to, to turn down any company that has to deal with online gambling or casinos, porn sites. We don't accept these kinds of clients. And that's largely because I'm a born again Christian. These are my beliefs and principles, but I respectfully tell them that, Hey, you know, there's a lot of SEO companies out there. They might be happy to take you in. It's just that I have uh, certain principles and I am unable to help you because of this, but you know, Good luck in your SEO endeavor. Also, I choose clients who are easy to work with, meaning they're not very meticulous. And for them, the money that they're going to be paying me is not their kidney and their liver. You know what? If you know what I mean, right? Because these clients who think that the money they're paying you is so big, they're going to be always at your neck. And I'm already at the point where we're a 12 year old company by the 15th year. I plan to let go a little bit more in terms of my management and my involvement in in the team. So we're professionalizing. I'm hiring people who are, uh, I'm promoting to C-level executive roles. So I prefer getting clients who are going to be happy working with us. And the money that they're going to be paying us is money that they set aside. It's not money that is going to be hurting them when they pay it to SEO hacker. I hope that helps you yeah no no uh, it's a very good point right we make the same decision here like if somebody comes to us they're desperate like we're their last hope it's not right yeah it's just not um and actually uh your answers they resonate well with our audience let me uh quickly uh highlight a question here from Andrew, Sean, how do you think things would go if you started SEO in 2022? Would it be easier with loads of data and video online or harder due to competition? That's a really good question. Yeah, really good question. (laughs) Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, thank you so much for the question. First and foremost, I want to let you know that I can only answer really from my perspective. So this is a biased perspective because I started 2009 and I think it's one of the most it's it's for me it's the perfect time to start but maybe it's because that's when i started you know that's my history and the reason why i say that is because that's the turning point for google when they released all of these hammers against people who were doing black hat seo they released google panda google penguin all of these um anti-spam algorithms and updates that are working in their engine right now so i came to be as an seo guy who was largely unfamiliar with black hat tactics and gray hat tactics. I was following Moz. I was following copy blogger. I was following a lot of white hat SEO people writing about white hat SEO. While a lot of these OG SEOs, and I don't mean you, Chris, you look, you look young. I don't mean you're OG, but you are, you are one of the original SEOs who yeah. started 25 years ago. A lot of the the people who might you might have been um, doing SEO as early as you are, Chris, they were disheartened because SEO became harder and harder. Now it's white hat. You can't do all the, the black hat stuff we were doing so easy to make money during that time when you're doing SEO. So they were disheartened. They left the game. I kept going because this is the SEO game that I'm used to playing. It's white hat already. So I think it's one of the perfect times to start way back. But if you're starting now, Yes, the competition is a lot tighter, but so the question is how you're going to sell, right? How are you going to get more clients? When you talk about competition, it's really because how are you going to get more clients? And for me, the answer to that is you just have to spread yourself. So this is how I do it. I'm still the main sales guy in SEO Hacker and the main marketing guy. And I just get myself out there. I network. I play golf. I... I speak in events. I was telling Chris, I was just in Phuket last week. I spoke in TBEX Travel and Business Expo 2022. And I was able to talk with 
the chief marketing officer of Marriott in Thailand just because I was speaking in that event. And I spoke about SEO as well. They invited me as a guest speaker. It was an all-expense paid trip. I was so blessed to be there. 100 people attended my talk. I kept promoting SE, SE ranking because I use SE ranking. So happy to use SE ranking. Ha very happy with the results that I'm getting with SE, SE ranking as well. And so I was networking. I got some good leads out of there. I get a lot of my clients from the keyword SEO Philippines because we're number one here in the country. We're literally ranking number one for that keyword. But if I didn't have that, if I don't own that keyword, that SEO Philippines keyword from Google, this is how I would be doing it. I would go out and do a lot of stuff, network, smartly network, right? I play golf, not because I have extreme fun playing the game, but because a lot of golfers are businessmen and they're big yeah. businessmen, right? So be very strategic in how you try to close deals and make your sales. I think you'll, you'll be able to make it big still, even if it's 2022. Man, we have time for one more really quick answer. We got a minute and a half left. Sure. Um, I find that an interesting question. Uh, how do you price a job? Is it based on an hourly rate? Does the size of the company turn? Blah, 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 blah. I can quickly tell you how we do it. We have three pricing models, two, three, or 4,000 divided by the average hourly rate. In our case, 125. We do all the same stuff. Just takes a little bit longer. That's how we do it. How do you price a job? So we have three thousand uh, dollars per month. We don't divide per hour because mm -hmm. I personally don't like to do a lot of math. So we just close because most of our clients here in the Philippines are big enterprise clients, like yeah. the biggest malls, the biggest stuff. Um, so they're just happy just paying that monthly rate to us. For me, I prefer to do it that way, but I think you would be able to close more deals doing it the way that Chris is doing it, where you have tier pricing. We don't have tier pricing because we're widely known as number one here in the Philippines. And that's that's the thing. If you have a very good branding and you're known as the best, people will pay whatever you're charging, right? I mean, uh, two, three, two, three, four thousand is a very good rate already. 3,000 US charging here in the Philippines, that's super high. I think we're the most expensive SEO company here, but because we're the number one, we can charge pretty much everything. Yeah. Uh, turnover, yes, the turnover does affect the quote that we give. That's why we do our best try to try to minimize the turnover. Now, if the turnover is a positive turnover, meaning the client, um, not positive, but it's a client side turnover. They mismanage their resources. There's a different marketing manager and he or she doesn't want SEO. Like these things we cannot affect anymore, right? It's client side turnover. But anything SEO hacker side turnover, meaning we screwed up, one of my people screwed up, we try to fix all of these things and create process documents so it doesn't happen again. Cool. So, yeah. Sean, we're at the end of our time together. I certainly let's connect on LinkedIn. I'd love to, yeah. uh, you know, keep in touch. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of SC Ranking. Thank you. Thank you for having for me. Your presentation it was a pleasure. Wearing your T-shirt. Yes. So. Eat, sleep, optimize. Cool. Yeah. Sean, yeah. thank you so much. Be well. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, okay. guys. All right. On to our next topic uh, we're gonna chit chat a little about uh, the latest and greatest what's happening in seo right now i hope uh jennifer turnbull has joined me there we seo show blogs Oh my God, man, I love when things work technically. <laughs> so far, so good. SEO Joe Blogs. Jennifer, uh, we briefly caught up uh, yesterday, got to know you a little bit. Why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? Hello, Chris. Uh, thanks for... Um... Uh, presenting the, the SEO news with me and a big thank you to SE Ranking for putting on this event. I'm SEO Joe Blogs, also known as uh, Joe Juliana Turnbull here in the industry. I've got uh, Jennifer is my mom, but it's also a great name. And I spoke uh, to Jennifer earlier today. She... Well, Jen Jenny's, a, Jenny's a good name. And I've been uh, working in the online industry since about 2000 and 
eight, uh, the SEO industry, and before that was e-commerce and uh, finance. So really uh, looking forward to sharing some of the news today because, yes, SEO can sometimes seem a little bit overwhelming with all the different news and events that are taking place. And uh, I'm a freelance SEO and marketing consultant, and uh, news is something that we all need to keep abreast and uh, ahead of. Cool, cool. Let's dive right into it. We don't have that much time. Um, a big announcement that uh, you know recently surfaced was a uh, Google uh, links will become less important. It's a less important ranking signal. So I've been talking about this here at my company for actually quite some time now. I mean, essentially, if you think about it, right, it, it was the first and only ranking signal when uh, Google started, when the entire industry um, came about. But it was also the biggest problem, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to figure it out. And actually, I do believe Google has figured it out, as I showed you yesterday with that example, one of our clients. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, what do you th make of that? So I was actually at the conference. It was Brighton SEO uh, last month when John yeah. Mueller mentioned that. Um, the thing is, as you said as well, you know, they, they have said this before. But what I would say is that we shouldn't panic about it. Google's have said for years about links. It's not important. Um, I think it may be because people used to spam a lot. So they said it's important for people to be able to find your site, uh, users. And also one way of doing that in the olden days obviously was only through links. Now, because people maybe over spammed it, of course, that became an abused way. And, uh, but it's not to say that actually, you know, having uh, good and uh, natural links to your site that's actually still very important. Exposure for any brand is important. Links from the relevant sites, from any campaigns that you're that you're working on, it's very important, and it does positively impact, you know, your site. We need users, uh, potential new customers, to know about your brand and your campaign, and they do that because you've executed great marketing campaigns, and. From doing that, you get more exposure, you get featured on other sites, those are links. So I think we need to just look at the whole thing in context. What do you what do you do for your clients to earn links or get links? Like what, what links are you looking for? How do you how do you approach the whole link building? I hate that word, link building um, topic. Uh, I know still a lot of clients that I talk to, they're like, oh, yeah, we need links. I'm like, well, let me explain what's happening with, you know, recent Google algorithm updates, et cetera, et cetera. How do you approach that topic if somebody asks you or tells you, hey, I want links? What do you, what do, you do? So what actually I've been doing is it's, um, I called it relationship building. So I actually did my first talk back in SES New York back in 2013, and I called it... Um, all about relationship building. So screw link building, it's relationship building. And if you are building those relationships with the bloggers and different journalists, you will get, or you're building your own community, you will get exposure and you will get links. So I think it's important to build your brand. One way of that is, yes, you will have some links on other people's sites, but it's relevant to your sector. It's relevant to your website. I wouldn't just say, oh, you know, I need to have five, five new links per month. No, I want to get a lot of exposure on specific campaigns and I'd want to actually drive traffic off the back of some of that advertising or promotion. All right. Why don't we, uh, just today or yesterday, uh, Google published a page about their ranking systems. And I'm not sure if you already saw that. It brand new news. I'm sure Barry Schwartz will potentially talk about it. So the Google announced that, hey, these are the systems that are running now. And these are the systems that we have retired. Um, the old Google page speed 
algorithm uh, system gone? Like, what, what do you make of that? I'd say that Google, they give us a lot of tools, but then they also take them away. So that is one example. Another one in the summer was the age of line that they were yeah. getting, um, getting rid of as well. And another one before that was the fact that you could maybe deprioritize site links in your Google search console. So what I would always recommend is that we use a variety of tools. We maximize uh, what we have within Google search console, but maybe we try not to be always 100% so dependent uh, on that because if something changes, then sometimes we're a bit, um, it can put us in a, in a poor position. So for example, the age of flying, that was very useful to have it, but I don't think everyone was, well, it depends on your strategy. Some people were 100% dependent on it, other people uh, were not. So I would say we need to maximize the resource that we do have, use Google search, call it other tools, such as um, SE ranking to, to help us sort of meditate any of these changes that uh, Google will bring in. All right, cool. So we're nearly at the end of the short section here already. Uh, we are going to talk more in a little bit here. Um, why don't we, gosh, any anything else that you want to share right now? Anything that popped up very recently? I think we have one minute left. So let me see. There's actually a yeah. question. If we can, let me see. So what are you really saying is create content that is so good that people will link organically from their site to yours? I mean, ultimately, that's the, the best link strategy, right? Yeah, because if you, you know, you will get people coming to your site. Now, those links, no, those links won't become less relevant, you know, because you're still getting people coming to your site. You know, if someone is, you know, creating something about, let's say, espresso you know i i can make the best espresso martini or i can make the best coffee and you have one only you have a blog about coffee and other people are really like those blog posts you've done you maybe you do one about themes like thanksgiving coming up this week christmas uh next next month and someone's linking to you and they're maybe uh you know um time out magazine or even a, a smaller blogger those are still relevant so that's what i mean about um it's important to have in everything in, in, in context and to not sort of over panic. It's, well, it's not really panic at all when sort of Google releases these updates, like, you know, what John Mueller says, oh, links yeah. are not important. You have to look at it as a whole. Perfect. We're at the end of this uh, chit chat for now. We'll talk again very shortly. Thank you yeah, thank so you. much. And yeah, let's uh, introduce Lydia Infante. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye. Hey, Hi. Lydia. How's it going? It's going good. How are you? Good, good, good. I don't think you and I have met before, right? I don't think we have met in no. person, no. but I know and adore your team. Thank you so much. <laughs> They're amazing. <laughs> Lydia, uh, I'm super excited. Uh, we're super excited to have you here. Uh, you're the senior SEO manager at sanity.io. Why don't you quickly introduce yourself? Yeah. So, well, I'm the senior SEO manager at sanity.io. Um, I've been in SEO for Almost a decade. I think it's been about eight to nine years at the moment, which is quite, quite a journey. Um, and I actually have a background in psychology. That's that's where I come from. And I have a master's degree in digital business. Um, I've been working in agency side. I've been working um, in media, which I love. I'm obsessed with working in SaaS. Um, and I'm really, really into SEO strategy. So not just like following around all the crazy changes in algorithms and all that jazz, but making a business impact. Very cool. Uh, so your presentation is about data, which is critically important for SEO. 
we don't have that much time. So why don't we dive right into it? And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A um, and summarize your presentation at the end. Let's uh, dive right into it. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so that's my presentation. We, we know that. We've already done it. Um, let's talk about why I chose to go with a gap analysis. Because if you listen to the word gap analysis, it, it puts you to sleep. To sleep. It sounds super boring. So um, I do find this, that when you take a step back and analyze what your competitors are doing, you have a way better chance to actually make sense of your strategy and create tactics and strategies that are actually going to make you rank because we are not ranking in a vacuum. Um, SEO is a zero sum game, which means that every position that you gain, someone is losing. So you're not ranking alone. It doesn't depend on what you do only. Um, it depends on what your competitors are doing and what your search environment is doing with you. So I do find that a, a gap analysis, as boring as it sounds, can be made fun. Um, and we're not going to take it just as a concept. I'm going to be using some examples of when I joined my job at Sanity, the gap analysis that I did in June. So the way that I structure my gap analysis is around the three pillars of SEO. As you all know, we've got technical SEO, we've got content, and we've got links. I like to think about technical SEO as what enables um, search engines to find and understand your content and what enables users to enjoy it. Um, and then we've got links that tell Google, um, yeah, this, this content makes sense. I believe in this content, I vouch for this content. Um, so it all comes down to the content, which is what is going to satisfy user intent, which is why we say that content is king. When we're looking at your performance and your competitors' performance across the board, um, based on those three pillars, you need to understand that if you're already the best at technical SEO, pushing for more technical SEO changes and improvements might not be the thing that moves the needle for you. Um, you might be needing links, you might be needing content. Um, to understand it, you need the gap analysis. So the very first thing we're going to have to do is answer three questions. Who are our competitors? What are they doing? And how are we going to do it better than them? So for the first question, we're going to have to talk about competitor identification. There's a couple of methods for it, but what do I mean when I talk about search competitors? For me, a search competitor is someone that's targeting the same audience as you, um, that's ranking for the same keywords as you or targeting the same keywords as you. Um, and it is someone that would make your product obsolete because there's Rather than obsolete, a better way to say it is that if your target audience chooses their product, they no longer need your product. There's several different examples, but if, if I was thinking of buying some toys for my cat and I'm looking around at cat toys, someone selling a cat fountain would not be your competitor. Um, I, can, I can buy from both. Um, and if I'm looking for solutions to a better night's sleep, maybe I could buy a pillow, and also a scented candle that makes me, that, that's lavender scented and makes me sleep better. So you would not be like battling this other person. It's not a very, it's not quite a direct competitor. So you essentially we're overlapping two aspects of business, um, a commercial competitor and a SERPs competitor. So the way that I want to do this is with two approaches, the top-down approach and the bottom-up approach. I'm gonna explain both approaches and who they're best for. So the top-down approach is very fast and it's best for websites that are already somewhat established. This approach also helps you build better relationships with your business. So the way that I do the top-down approach is super easy. You just speak to your teams, speak to the sales team, the support team, the marketing team, speak to product, ask them who their, your competitors are and compile a list of what everyone said, prioritize it by the most repeated competitors and then um, simply put your domain on a competitive research tool. So this could be SEMrush, Ahrefs, SA Ranking, obviously, 
you could be looking at Cistrix um, and run down the list to see where the matches are, where the competitors in your team thinks are your competitors um, and where the tool says those are your competitors. So that would be the sweet spot between product competitors and search competitors. What this also does is it helps you create these relationships within the team and it improves buy-in for your competitor list and therefore for your gap analysis um, because everybody feels like they've participated, that they've got a stake in the game. Then we've got the bottom-up framework and the bottom-up framework is more precise. Um, I don't think it helps you build as many relationships internally. So it's a little bit harder to get that um, way ahead with buy-in. Um, and it's best for starting sites. So for a while I was consulting very briefly for a banking website, a, a website for a banking brand that was starting out in the UK. And the bottom-up framework was the best approach for them because um, they had no presence. So it made no sense. None of the tools were going to pick them up um, on the top-down framework. It also helps you, it helps you in many ways. Let me just get started with the methodology and we can cover it. So you have to identify your target keywords. What are my target keywords? Maybe it's a business bank account. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's just like cat toys, right? Just a list of your core keywords. And then I download the top 10 results from the SERPs for those keywords. Once I have this big download, if I'm if I'm looking at ten keywords, it would be a hundred keyword, um, a hundred lines download. If I'm looking at twenty, it's gonna be um, two hundred. I analyze what are the most repeated domains within that um, within that data set. Then I measure what percentage of the total SERPs that compete with me these domains are dominating. And that way I have a very good idea of who my competitors are. Now, sometimes my competitors are not going to be the same for all of my products or across all of my topics. So what I do recommend if you want to make the most out of this framework is to cluster your keywords by topic and then analyze your competition by topic. Um, competitor analysis is super interesting and the, I really, really think this framework is very useful. So I have created a small template for all of you to dive into. So you can reach it on bit.ly slash SEO competitors, um, and we can link it here in the comments. So now that we've got your competitors, we can get into SEO benchmarking. So that's like the meat of what we are talking about. We're going to use data to reverse engineer our competitor's SEO strategy. As I said, we're going to be using those three pillars and we're going to be starting with content. So some of the content metrics that I look at are the number of keywords ranking in the top 30. Um, then I download all the editorial URLs or I count all the editorial URLs and I kind of get um, what percentage of traffic, like the estimated traffic for each editorial URL. I look at estimated traffic by type. This is especially uh, relevant if you're working in SaaS. So you've got branded versus unbranded traffic, traffic that's going to editorial, traffic that's going to product. Um, you can tailor this to whatever is more relevant to your business, because you could also be discussing content frequency. You could be talking about fluctuations in the top 10. There's many ways to measure this. This is what works for me. And this is what I did when I joined Sanity. So I prepared a bit of a content benchmark and I look at how much estimated traffic we had, how much of that was editorial, how much of that was branded, and how much of that was product. I realized that we had about 256 editorial URLs. So that's the URLs that are, are created for like editorial content that could be blogs, guides, resources, white papers. Um, and I divided the estimated editorial traffic um, across our editorial URLs and figured out that actually we had pretty good editorial efficiency, which means 
most of our URLs are getting more traffic than our competitors. But if you look at the number of editorial URLs, we are somewhat below. This is, is very obvious, it's like screaming to me that we needed to create more content. And this is something that I've made a big focus in my strategy in Sanity. Now then we've got brand metrics and this section is super interesting because um, I've seen people adapt this methodology in many different ways and people come with brilliant ways, people come up with brilliant ways of measuring brand um, and their relationship to SEO. The plainest one, the easiest one is talking about referring domains and backlinks. We can look at domain authority, we could look at the search volume of the branded queries, which I think is super interesting. We can create a bit of a link up to understand how far away we are from our competitors in terms of domains and backlinks. Um, and we can analyze what their link growth has been in the last three, six, 12 months to understand whether or not they are investing in link building, which makes a very good case to go to your C-level management and say, Competitor, aspirational competitor X is investing in lead building, therefore we should. Um, baiting, well, that sounds really bad, but baiting the, the C level management into competition by taking a look at their aspirational competitors is typically quite um, an effective way of getting buy in for your strategy. So when I did this for Sanity, I, I can clearly see that we are below average in terms of brand if we are comparing ourselves uh, against our competitors. Luckily, this graph looks very different now. Um, but initially, we were looking like we had less branded traffic than the average in the market. We had less backlinks. We had less sort of referring domains. We were kind of average in terms of DA, but that doesn't mean much. Um, we had a pretty good brand search. So what is going on here? You know, we have um, some pretty big brand search, but not a lot of branded traffic. Um, likely, by looking at this graph alone, you could argue that we don't have the branded content that users were looking for. This is something that we have fixed. Um, and fortunately, works a lot better now. Um, and we can also see that our link growth is the biggest in the in the segment in the search segment that we're analyzing. So we were acquiring links quite fast. Then what I like to do as part of the brand benchmark, and this is not qualitative, sorry, it's not quantitative data, it's qualitative data, and you can analyze it in the same way. It's not as straightforward. Um, it's looking at their H1 and their meta. And I kind of pulled it in with an import XML formula on Google Sheets, and I analyzed what people are saying about their brands. So for example, when you look at Sanity, our H1 says content is data. And when you look at what our meta says is Sanity is the unified content platform that lets your team work together in real time to build engaging digital experiences across channels. So what I look, what I, what I read here, our meta says, we're a unified content platform. Um, it accentuates work, uh, team collaboration, let your team work together, real-time collaboration, building engaging digital experiences. So we're talking about digital experiences rather than websites or software across channels. This means omni-channel, collaborative, real-time. Um, then I look at what our competitors are saying and they define themselves mostly as headless CMSs, and they highlight that they're open source, uh, that they enable content-rich experience, um, and they also somewhat accentuate that they are omni-channel. Um, most of them talk about this. For example, our competitor number two says publish content on any channel. Competitor number three just lists a bunch of channels. Um, it's really interesting to see how your competitors are talking about themselves and what are the value propositions that they are using. Because um, in SEO, if, you, if you're a little bit siloed within your business, you might struggle to understand how your brand's being viewed or product positioning. Personally, this really helps me and it helps me also get a good grasp of what the key keywords 
are for my competitors to do. Now, when it comes to technical SEO, sadly, I hate saying this, but it depends. I have found different ways of measuring this, but essentially it's going to depend on your vertical and your industry. Because I am in SaaS, technical SEO is a little bit simpler for me than it would be if I was um, running a programmatic affiliate site or if I was running an e-commerce, right? We've got different levels of technical complexity happening. But there's still some stuff that you can measure. You can look at Core Web Vitals scores, PageSpeed Insights, and do some manual checks across sitemaps, robots, TXT, et cetera. So the best unifying way that I've found to analyze um, whether or not a brand is investing in their technical SEO is looking at their web performance optimization efforts by taking a look at Core Web Vitals and PageSpeed. Um, using the Chrome UX report that is available for anybody for free on Google Data Studio, um, I pull the percentage of good URLs in terms of um, LCP, FID, and CLS, um, and then I draw an average. And I use that average to compare Core Web Vitals across all of my competitors. And then for page speed, I look at mobile and I look at desktop and I bring it out right there. Because we are in SaaS, desktop is the most relevant score for me here. But if I was in a type of e-commerce that requires a lot of, um, well, that, that has a lot of consumption on the phone, I would play, pl place a lot more attention on my page feed on mobile. Um, then for the last step of our, of our gap analysis, we're going to have to find what we are below average at. And that's where we're going to get results. So we're not going to, what have we seen for sanity? We're seeing that in terms of content, we are average. In terms of brand, we are below average. And in terms of tech SEO, we're kind of on the average. So we need to be working on brand SEO. Then we need to devise a plan, right? We, we've identified what our weak pillar is. We know that we would need to work on it. So how are we going to do it? Because without execution, there's no ROI. You can look at spreadsheets all day long, and they can be as pretty and as conditional formatted as possible. Um, but if you don't actually do things with that information, um, you're not going to be able to move the needle for your business. So we're going to make a growth plan. Identify our weakest pillar. And we're going to be looking at the results. We know that brand is below average. Now, when I made this analysis, I had just arrived at this company. Um, the likelihood of a CMO just letting me reign free and run around building links and creating digital PR campaigns was low, right? I, I think it makes sense to protect your brand um, and not let the person that you've just hired um, go and run amok with your brand around the internet. So instead of proposing that we went with brand, I proposed that we went with content, which is also what I am best at in the three pillars of SEO, in my opinion. So we're going to communicate where we're not performing. In case of brand, we can see that we are lacking referring domains, that we are lacking backlinks, but that we have a pretty decent brand recognition in comparison. So we will be needing branded content to match all of this branded search. And we're going to roadmap how we're going to improve it. In that case, um, what I did was, because I, I worked with content first, I created a content plan um, and identified what resources were going to be needed. So we needed some review time from our development team. We needed some review time from our content team. And sometimes we need review time from our product team. Um, also, we needed a writer. And we needed something, someone to put things live on our website. Um, a detailed plan of this got approval of everybody in the team, all the stakeholders. I managed to get ring fence resources for all of those approvals that we needed. Um, and it was a go. And we were creating content for a while. Then when it comes to brands, I managed to get 
some resources to start doing building with the brand. Um, but it's a project that we haven't started yet. So I can't speak to how successful it's been. So we're getting stakeholder buying. This is something that we've already covered. And as I mentioned, I, I was new at Sanity. The smartest way for me to deliver value was to go with a pillar that required this buy-in. So I went with content. Um, and then you execute and you make it happen. I know that this seems like a lot of data and a lot of information, but I am the unofficial self-declared queen of templates. So I have created a template for you to make this yours. Um, you can just click away, make a copy, um, edit it to your heart's content and make sure that it is relevant for you and for your business because you know your business best. Now, if I've been talking about Sanity and you're curious to try it, um, we're offering a free boosted plan on Sanity for everybody who's watching here. So feel free to jump on. And thank you so, so much for watching my talk. Cool. Thank you so much, Lydia. We only have a... We got a few minutes left for Q&A. Very interesting. Uh, why don't we start with a question from Nina. Um, link building has become way harder than how it was five years ago. True. It is more about contextual links, which are difficult to garner. How do you uh, how to get contextual links without a paid method fiber? Love to hear. Um, love to hear your answer. All right. So. Because I've worked in a, in a predominantly digital PR agency before, um, I know different approaches. You could go out with a news checking approach where you find new ways to to tie your new your brand. Sorry, I can't speak today. To tie your brand to the news um, and reach out to journalists with that. But something that's become quite trendy in the link building industry at the moment is creating assets with linking intent. When you are creating content, you're writing around, you need a stat to validate X statement that you've made. If you create the type of content that's gonna get links from the people who are looking to reference and validate what they're saying, you are likely to get passive links without any type of outreach if you manage to make that content rank, of course. Cool, excellent. Then let's see, question from Anastasia. How often should I do an SEO gap analysis to make sure my content remains fresh and better than the competition? Um, it depends on your industry. I know that for my industry, I need to do it at least every six months, preferably every three months. There's industries that move a little slower and you'd be cool just doing it um, yearly. But I think six months is a pretty good rule of thumb for everybody. Okay, excellent. Let me hide that. Um, let's take a look here. All right. Valeria, does it make sense to do an SEO gap analysis of a website I'm only planning to create? Or does it only apply to life size? Oh, that's a good question. It is a good question. Yeah. I think it makes sense, but with a different goal. So what we're trying to do here is we have an established website and we're trying to rank better than our competitors because um, we are not ranking as well as them. If you're building a new website, all of the SEO gap analysis work stops being a gap analysis and becomes competitor research. So if you look at that template and you remove your name from it, it's just competitor research from an SEO perspective. I think it's still very valuable and it lets you drive a strategy for the site that you're going to create. So instead of thinking, I need to have perfect uh, Core Web Vitals, maybe you see that you just need to have better Core Web Vitals than your competitors. And all that time that you haven't invested in that type of web performance optimization can be invested in other areas such as content or links. Excellent. And then Lydia, you're getting very positive feedbacks. And we also have some people asking for more in-depth uh, information, longer presentations. Head over to YouTube and just search for SE Ranking. 
lot of webinars that are at least an hour long. So if, uh, if you want to hear more, head over to YouTube, SE Ranking, a ton of great presentations there. Uh, Lydia, a question from Jack here. How can you increase content output as a freelancer? So I'm understanding from this message that the person writing is a freelancer, either is a freelancer or is employing a freelancer. I would um, say both. Oh, let's see if we can. Yeah, right? yeah. I think getting good briefs is absolutely key to getting content out fast. Um, nothing slows you down more than having to redo the content because it wasn't what your stakeholder needed. So st stakeholder coordination and making sure that the content briefs that you're creating uh, makes sense. Um, we can tend to skimp on that type of coordination and brief creation, but the higher the quality of the briefs, the the bigger the results. I think that's the, sing the single thing that improves your the results of your content best, investing in good briefs. Awesome. So Lydia, we have two more minutes. Why don't we take one more question here? Uh, Yay! Um, Ksenia, does the SEO gap analysis involve any contextual competitor content or multimedia as well? Minute and a half. That is super cool. Such a good question. So at the very beginning of the presentation, I mentioned grab your competitors, um, download who's ranking for your SERPs, and then cluster it by keyword. Another thing that you can do, and I have some templates for this on my website, um, with that very same download information, you can analyze what are the SERP features on the SERPs for your queries, right? So you can see that maybe a specific topic um, is very heavy on video or very heavy on images, very heavy on maps. Um, you can use that very same information to figure out where you are going to need to be creating video and images or podcasts. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you for having me. Yeah, that was cool. A lot of great questions. Uh, again, more in-depth, longer content available on uh, the SE Ranking YouTube channel. Lydia, thank you so much. Uh, we're off to our next speaker already. Right, Dan Taylor, head of technical SEO at Salt. Um, again, I don't think you and I have met before, so hey, Dan. Hey, Chris, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. Where are you located? Um, I'm in Leeds at the moment in the UK. Okay, very cool. Um, why don't you briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, no, sure. So, um, hey, everyone, my name is Dan Taylor, as Chris has introduced. I'm the head of technical SEO at Salt Agency. Prior to that, I was the head of research and development. Uh, we are a predominantly technical SEO agency. We're also specializing in kind of demand gen and visibility growth. Predominantly work with companies in the US um, and international campaigns. So people like Cloudflare, uh, Pro on Mail, Reformation, et cetera, those kind of brands. All right, you're gonna talk about tackling enterprise level seo problems that's a that's a big piece of cake to tackle right i'm personally very excited for your presentation we have about 30 minutes here so why don't we dive right in i'm sure there's going to be quite a few questions so uh yeah let's uh, listen to dan here awesome thank you very much um do you want me to share my screen chris or uh, you're going to have to click on present and then do you have your presentation open? Yeah, I do. I was prepared. Yeah, click on present and then just uh, select your presentation. Yeah, ready to go. There we go. Excellent. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey again, everyone. So as Chris um, said, I'm going to be probably talking about tackling enterprise level SEO issues and in this I'm not going to just try to focus on the actual individual or the technical parts of this I'm also going to go over and talk around 
the more nuances that enterprise level relationships can bring because more often than not a lot of the same problems you see at enterprise level are the same at medium or SME level just amplified but there's often more bureaucratic red tape different processes and usually a lot more technical debt to kind of go through so another quick overview uh I won't dwell on this too much, but like I said, head of technical SEO at Salt Agency. And if you want to follow me on any socials, I've got my Twitter, my Mastodon, and my YouTube link there, as well as a couple of web addresses if you want to find out more on the blogs that we go over, resources, etc. I also want just to cover as well um, this year, Salt Agency. We became the first and unfortunately the only SEO agency to receive a royal seal of approval from Her Late Majesty the Queen, um, which was presented to us by now King Charles III. So this was through work predominantly for international trade and innovation. So working with international brands and it's a nice award that we can now proudly use for the next five years. So like I said today, I'm going to go over four main key areas. And we're going to cover across indexing problems and essentially how indexing is becoming harder, especially on larger websites. And this is quite timely given that Google yesterday released a change in their terminology around ranking systems and actually parts of the algorithm. So we have some good information there. How to actually go about managing sites with high levels of user generated content or where content is your main offering piece. How to in my opinion, one of the most undersold parts of enterprise, and that's the support sections and how to amplify those for SEO and brand visibility. And then also one of the important things in enterprise, which is the feedback loop, and also stakeholder management when you're dealing with mega brands of international teams and everyone has different objectives and everyone has a different opinion on how things should go, but the end objective needs to be the same. So I also wanna cover off free enterprise shoes before we start. <laughs> And that's that when you're working on sites of large scale or even medium scale, perfect doesn't exist. That's all we talk about technical excellence, but technical excellence enterprise really is a working proficiency for a website, given its technical debt, its stack and other history, but it can actually achieve its organic and marketing objectives. It might not be pretty, there might be some tools flagging red in certain areas in certain places but as long as it's not affecting the bottom line technical excellence is what is excellence for the business the second element of the truth is about methodical prioritization and that is we know in seo some things are more impactful than others we have our own anecdotal experiences we have our own work and it's not when it comes to enterprise it's not so much focusing on as i've said the size of the issue but it's how we can create uh, an effectiveness and stakeholders love to see effectiveness and they love to see the effect and efficiencies as well as the overall performance gains. And that brings me on to the third point, which is that stakeholders do matter. And at Enterprise, you very, very rarely as a vendor relationship, you're siloed into a single team. In some enterprises we've worked with, that is the case, but more often than not, you tend to be joining a uh, scrum call, which has somebody from brand, UX, uh, engineering, product. It, it depends on how different enterprises run, but with more business unit structures, that is going to be something you're going to encounter a lot more. And with that, you need to learn and understand how stakeholders work and how to actually manage, not so much just what you're doing, but how you can better communicate what you're doing to the multiple stakeholders who ultimately need to like you because no matter what performance gains you get, if you're not liked, it's hard to get a re-sign on the contract for extensions. And another thing in enterprise is that there's never free things. Everything is always connected. Out, unless you're in siloed sprints doing title tags or canonicals, there'll be connections to other departments. There'll be reasons why certain things are happening where they are. And it's about stakeholder management, it's from methodical prioritization, and it's understanding the need that Perfect might not exist, but if it works and it's better than what it was before and it's not being black hat or sneaky, then that is perfect for organisation. Cookie cutter very, very rarely works at this level and he doesn't cut the mustard, especially when you're dealing with 
sophisticated users and sophisticated individuals. So let's talk about mega indexing. Indexing coverage reports in Search Console are something we all look at, something we all like. For me, they're also something which is greatly misunderstood. Now, obviously, it looks at the trends over time. We can overlay impressions, which is useful. And we can also see correlations in indexing between unconfirmed and confirmed Google updates. It's understanding, really, this report shows how Google feels about your website. As you can see in the example I've included here, there's just under 67 million pages indexed and 72 million not indexed. There's reasons for that, in fact, 15 reasons. I'm not gonna go for all 15 here, but generally more often than not, indexing is something that I see more and more commonly being raised across Twitter, Mastodon, Reddit, etc. over the past kind of year or so. With indexing, Google themselves have come out publicly. Um, Gary Ilyes did at a conference and Lily Ray greatly shared a photo of it on Twitter and that's a strong reference for it. It's a 60% of the internet in Google's eyes is duplicate content. Duplicate content not necessarily being the exact words on the page, but it's duplicate value propositions. 60% of the internet is saying exactly the same as each other. So there's no desire, there's no in, in impetus to invest in heavy amounts of indexing resources and storage and caching for essentially the same thing that's going to bring zero user benefit. As I said anecdotally, since November 2021, we've seen more and more indexing fluctuations across any websites, predominantly 100,000 URLs plus, even on some we work with which have just under a billion URLs. We're seeing these indexing fluctuations because Google's determining what is and isn't valuable to have in its immediate indexing and then for retrieval. With this, we also can see a shift in what is happening with this. And this is gonna impact enterprise and it's ultimately also gonna impact medium and small as well, especially where you're competing with what SEOs always complain about for brand preference. So you're competing with no names or elements like that. We already have Google's indexing API for specific post types, and we have index now in various stages of adoption through multiple search engines. It's not beyond the realm of possibility with what we're seeing, but we're gonna to have to become more prioritized with how we index and actually start focusing on the core pages. When we're trying to deal with multi hundred million URL websites at the enterprise level, we already have that problem. We're not going to get every URL indexed. And even if we go through the no index panel and we strip out all the parameters, all the redirects, all the canonicalized URLs, et cetera, there's still a heavy percentage which won't be indexed. John Mule has publicly said 20% of the website not being indexed is normal. That's probably going to carry on to grow bigger as a percentage, regardless of whether or not they're detritus URLs and parameters, et cetera, we didn't want anyway. So technically, the common reasons why we have this indexing problem are to do with quality thresholds, but essentially the page has fallen below what Google perceives as required for that source type. Now, source types can differ between e-commerce sites, informational sites, it's your, all different kind of brand levels. Each one has a different quality threshold, and this is why one search or search engine results pages where we have a mixture of commercial, informational, and different SERP features, They're all got, they all have different quality types, which gets pulled together, which makes keyword difficulty scoring at SERP level, um, which I know a lot of tools do, pretty much redundant now, but also to the point that it's not just, com you have to not just compete for that keyword, you have to compete with your source type for that keyword. The second main issue, when you see these issues in Search Console is essentially data delays. Search Console has different data pipelines and different parsing procedures for different reports. Sometimes you'll go and do a site search for URL, you'll see it in Google search, you'll look in Search Console and it'll say it's not indexed. Two days later, everything's fine. That happens more often than not. And when you're dealing with massive amounts of URLs, that's extremely common to see. And you almost have to take reporting over time versus ad hoc single day reporting. Other issues go down to your content value proposition, which again impacts your quality threshold. And 
the fourth reason is simply you could be asking Google to index and process more URLs than you actually deserve to have. I've seen um, people in Slack groups and Reddit groups over the past two, three months launching 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 programmatically built pages when their website previously only had about 5,000 pages. You're suddenly asking Google to index and give resource to a lot, lot more pages and it will do it slowly and do it over time. You can't just flip a switch and ask Google to do that. When you're at an enterprise, when you're, I keep saying enterprise level, or when you're dealing with over 100 million URLs, you almost have to sculpt pseudo HTML sitemaps just to keep Google from, to keep it, keep hitting actual URLs you want it to crawl and to try and keep it focused. Otherwise, you can lose it down rabbit holes. And we see that in log files quite a lot. It'll go down a rabbit hole and it won't crawl a, a solid URL for a week or so. Not that crawl frequency impacts ranking, but when you have high change frequencies or internal link changes, or you're constantly in evolving infrastructure, which a lot of enterprise sites are, making sure fresh URLs are crawled, URLs you want to drop out are crawled or recognized is a management process, which is unlike anything you really see on smaller sites, but it's also about factoring that Google has to have time to do processing. So the four main things I want to talk about with quality thresholds is essentially that Google does have a different quality threshold for different source types. Um, and this is made up of a number of factors. Freshness, we know, is one of these factors. So this occurs when you have a URL which is not indexed. You'll submit it uh, via Search Console's inspect tool. It might appear in an in index for a couple of days and then it'll drop back out again. That's because the freshness boost took it above the quality threshold. But then once it lost that freshness efficacy, it drops. Freshness doesn't apply to every single query and doesn't apply to every single URL. So again, it might not work in all cases, but that's saying you need to work on other factors. Google's aware of it. You need to improve quality. Similarly, with beneficial purposes, um, Google's definition of this, and this has been around as long as EAT in the quality rate guidelines, and is very pertinent to indexing, is that all pages have a beneficial purpose. The beneficial purpose could be to be informational, it could be to sell something, it could be to get a newsletter sign up, it could be to mask itself as an informational page but ultimately try to sell a product. Google can understand what the intent and purpose of that page is no matter how much you mix or mask it. And if it has no beneficial purpose, in the words, it's crossing too many lanes and it's nothing to nobody, then it has a low page quality which I'm not going to cover too much because that is covered under E quite a bit. And that's basically on the needs met scale. And even if you have no beneficial purpose, you have a very low page quality. And then the fourth one is the main content supporting content element. And that can be transposed to the design of a page, the main block, the main purpose. It's again, something which does impact indexing, especially when you start looking at query and query cluster level. So things you can actionably do outside of this is just actually knowledge that not all index errors in Search Console are actually errors. Some of them is just Google reporting, it's just bad terminology for like an error. For example, if you have a load of parameters and you're purposefully no indexing all your parameters, it won't be indexed. The report is not indexed because you've asked it to. That needs to be communicated as well. Interview are wanting URLs to be indexed on mass on scale. You want to make sure that well, you actually want to eyeball the SERP. You want to look at the different source types you are competing against. If you're an informational source and the top five results are commercial and they're selling something, top five might not realistically be achievable. You need to aim for your source type on that SERP. And then over time, let Google experiment, see if different results and different source types a matter in different places and then make that decision on, and allow Google to make that decision but give it all the tools possible to rank you as highly as possible. The second one is around the beneficial purpose and I see this a lot at enterprise um, because a lot of enterprise businesses are quite heavily sales driven and with that business model so they'll mix heavy sales messaging and heavy product messaging in with informational messaging which completely skews the purpose of the content. And if Google's unable to determine the beneficial purpose or 
oh, is this actually trying to help a user or is it trying to rank for helpful terms and then sell to the user? You need to unblur those lines because in my experience, every time you give Google a decision to make, it will oftentimes make the decision against you. And then the third one essentially is about additional value. 60% of the internet being duplicated is what you're producing giving additional value or is it repeating more of the same but in a different way and in your opinion a better way and then that's the question of do you actually deserve for that content to be indexed do you deserve for that url to be shown second enterprise level problem we come across a lot is websites who have essentially their business model is based around high volumes of user generated content there's some easy or GitLabs, GitHubs, Pinterests, Ebays. All their content offering is typically relied on user upload and user input. You need to be able to manage that so that you're returning value still to people searching and encouraging others to use the platform. So again, I break that down into three different more examples. So there's a product sites, which are eBay gum trees. You've got your repositories, so your GitLabs, GitHubs, etc., cetera, paste bins, whatnot, and then value posts, so your Quora's, Medium's, Pinterest, um, I think probably to an extent Hive, Social now, um, Twitter probably used to be that until three weeks ago. But essentially, all these three models rely on that user upload. Now, some have higher change frequency than others, some have higher upload frequency than others. But the ultimate point of users uploading to that platform is discovery. They either want to be discovered through the internal search on those platforms, or they want to be discovered through external search and have their work adopted, especially in the case of things like Quora, uh, Medium, um, GitLab, uh, Jenkins. Um, their whole purpose is people upload to those boards, and if they make them public, they want people to adopt, use the code and the license, and spread reach. So with this, you almost need to, I mean, the only way to do this at scale is to do priority automation. Other websites have done similar things around this, but essentially you want to, or you can't make judgment calls when some of these websites have million plus page turnover frequencies every day. It's impossible to do it manually, but you need to work on webhooks and verifications. So one of the systems of doing this for indexing is a karma-based system. So this is actually taking the user account and rewarding good quality posters over time. And that can be things, even if they reward you with advertising elements. So this is, for example, account age. Um, if they verify their account, so you actually have uh, a notion of that person is real. You have a notion of which country that person is in. And you might have some other demographic data about that person from the verification that can increase and improve ad targeting. So as a platform, you can sell more, re you can generate more revenue through, through selling advertising and targeting to that individual. Account posting and activity frequency. So one of the big common issues that I faced working on the UGC platforms usually comes around um, pay-per-view boxing and pay-per-view UFC fighting. You'll have people go, oh, these domains have got very high authority, they're very powerful brands, will spin up a, um, I know Alexander Music v Tyson Fury Boxing URL, create a user, create a page, and then they'll put a phishing link on there. It will probably get ranked for five, six hours. There'll be an, there'll be an appetite for people searching for that. And they're fished a few thousand people on the back of piggybacking off a UGC domain. But if you have an account, if you have a karma-based system, that content won't get indexed. So it deters bad actors and also helps with the community contribution as well. The second element around it is indexing API. And again, if the EGC's jobs, broadcasts, or embedded video objects, you can just work with that and make sure that if people are posting jobs, for example, you're doing your utmost to get it indexed as quickly as possible within Google because no one's like adding to your job board for people not to be able to find it and people search in different ways. So if you can maximize and reduce friction in that area, you're providing a better, you're basically providing a better product and better customer service as well. Third one is the crawl prioritization. So this is almost trying to keep control. So again, this can be done through karma-based systems where new users 
have a different subfolder in their user uh, URI strings, or they have a specific parameter appended to their profile URLs. And it's about how we dynamically control crawling and indexing of those, or whether or not we just want certain sections blocked off altogether for certain times of year, we want to prioritize seasonality, et cetera, or even use seasonal sitemaps or things like that. Um, and the fourth one is automated internal linking trees. So that is effectively HDR sitemaps that auto-generate links based on uh, internal search, uh, based on uh, page view data being fed back in. So if people are starting to search for more topics due to real world events, we're creating link trees with low click depth for, for one of a better word, page rank distribution. Even though we don't have page rank scores anymore, we know Google to an extent still uses internal link flow and et cetera. So we can almost tailor crawl paths dynamically and give Google better paths to trending stuff, which is better for users. The third enterprise trick, which I want to kind of go over, and I say trick because this can be applied to any business of any size, and that's the amplification of support sections. Now, more often than not, when I speak to businesses, they want to drive traffic for commercial keywords, they want to drive traffic for how-tos, things they perceive as being funnel keywords, your tofu, mofu, and bofu stuff, top of funnel, middle funnel, etc. And support sections are equally as powerful in doing this, because with a support section, you can not only tailor for queries, which otherwise would be left to be answered by things like Stack Overflow and other random Reddit threads, you can almost tailor this as a retention method as well. You can have people doing the brand search, people have to resolve said things on your site, and you can also include issues which might not be specifically related to your platform or competitive platforms, and be a sidestep of actually acquiring it and acquiring users or getting in front of users for a secondary conversation. Usually on most support platforms, especially those in companies which are often just starting out, there's typically three types of support article. There's the ones which I've called a marketing propaganda, which is posing as something helpful, which is great if it's an onboarding element or a how-to element for that specific platform, great. But often there's a lot of marketing wolves in help sheep's clothing, uh, which is neither use nor ornament to anyone. A lot of support forums where users are allowed to upload questions are just thin, unanswered, they get closed after 21 days, it's not maintained, and it just looks bad. It makes the cute, like your cues in your support element look untended, and it's a put off of a brand. And then the worst one of all is when you have it being left, when the questions are basically left to be answered by a community with no moderation. The number of tech um, companies I've seen who have created Reddit threads for their own company who literally don't monitor it. And then I go in and there'll be someone asking a question and somebody who admits they're from a competitor is answering the question and almost stealing a customer over because you just kind of created something because it'll be a social asset probably posted a few things, didn't get any reach, and it's been left out to pasture, but your user base is asking for help there and your competitors are answering it. And just to kind of back this up, I included a couple of stats, one from Batlingo, which um, probably needs verifying, but the 14% of Google searches being a question, um, and also the 13% of searches for an image, and uh, so Google searches are for an image and 13% is for an image pack. So that my emphasis here is you don't necessarily just have to answer questions with words. You can use diagrams. Diagrams with text and alt text and contextual text around them are really powerful. And because images are seen as a resource have to be built, make a Canva account, do something low cost or accessible, but include that in support articles, include logic trees or flow charts, because there's an untapped element there which you could get brand brand visibility in, as well as some SERP real estate. So just kind of give you an idea of how this tactic can work. This is a support subdomain that I worked on a few years ago. And throughout the last two quarters of 2016, we basically prepared a load of questions and we had engineers answering them. 
some of the answers were two words long, some of the answers were three, four paragraphs long, some of them included images, some didn't. But it was all questions we were finding people were asking, not about this brand specific products and software, but also more general marketing, or sorry, market software questions, which weren't specific to that brand, but we could probably get away with answering them. And then we published them all in December. It took a while to be crawled because it was a big site. We saw an initial spike in January, a little bit of ups and downs. And then as you can see, late towards that year, we just kind of took off. And that is the sessions um, data there as well, which I've pulled through. And that grew, that's visibility, that is active people, both retention and new customers looking for questions you're answering on the site. And the last thing I wanted to kind of cover off um, before getting into questions, and this is a very useful tool, is, I mean, I've called this feedback loops of internal teams. It's more than that. It's stakeholder management and it's basic stakeholder practices, which at enterprise level, when you're working with huge teams and, multiple, and not all of them are SEOs, not all of them are even marketers, understanding how to translate what you're doing as an SEO oftentimes is difficult enough because most of us don't want to talk with certainty about the unknown so we say it depends or we add caveats to answers or we move around things but understanding how to communicate with the different internal teams helps with this greatly especially in large elements so in enterprise teams this is typically what it looks like you've got us as an external seo vendor you'll have a brand team you'll have engineering you'll have products I put content in internal brackets because content sometimes lives as its own team, sometimes it lives as PR, sometimes it lives even within brand. But there's multiple, sometimes there's multiple content teams. You'll still need to interact with all of them at different points. Some circles and spheres of influence are much bigger in a five as well. But it's about understanding who's at the table and who has influence over the strategy, who is doing something which could influence certain things and having them on side because they're ultimately going to affect the metrics which we are judged on so that's why i work with this and i tell my team members politics in large organizations is almost as important as the internal performance and one of the best ways of doing this is something called a racy chart and that is what this diagram is on the left it's about understanding who is responsible for the action it's understanding who is accountable for it more often than not as the external vendor the accountability that the responsibility will fall on the client and the accountability will fall on the vendor because we're accountable for performance or they're accountable for providing recommendations but the client is responsible more often than not for implementing them in terms of the consulted this will be your secondary layer of stakeholders so if we're doing something to a commercial page which refers around a product we will consult with the product team. We will make, we will ask them questions. We will talk about the USPs of them. We'll see if, because they often have great insight into products in the marketplace and into their own product that they're marketing, that can help with messaging. And then there's the, the, the tertiary stakeholders. So this could be in this instance, the UX team, brand team, uh, PPC team. It's just keeping them informed. It's keeping them in the loop of activities. We ask other teams for data all the time. We need to keep this loop open in both ways and give them the same element. Simple racy charts like this, and even taking this mantra into how we go and work with them, oftentimes makes better working environments. Now, this is something you can do at enterprise level. This is something you can do at SME or medium level. Even, if we've ex even external vendors can go into this. Ultimately, you're going to be accountable for recommendations and the strategy. The client is going to be responsible for implementation. You want to consult external vendors and consult that secondary stakeholder level and inform tertiary vendors and tertiary stakeholders. The CMO or the C level will often flip between consulted and informed. That will depend on their engagement level, how much they want to know, but typically they'll flip between the two. So on that note, I want to say thank you for um, having me and for letting me go through the slides of the sort of answer of the challenges of enterprise. And um, yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen, Chris, and hand back to you. And I guess go to questions if there are any. 
Cool. Thank you so much, Dan. Why don't we take, we got a lot of questions. Uh, why don't we take a couple of questions here before we move on? I know this is probably a pretty complex question. Maybe uh, give a easier answer. How do you deal with websites that have multiple language versions? Something other than uh, can be done with Canonical. Yeah, no, that's a great question, um, Annika. So with websites with multiple language versions, hreflang is your first port of call. You want to make sure that your English version is referencing your French version as an alternate, your French as your German as an alternate, and ultimately closing the loop on itself. Um, what typically tends to happen if, with large sites with multiple language versions is when you start going into the realms of German for Germany, German for Austria, and Germany for Switzerland, because the business might be geared up with different prices or different sales teams for those regions, but you're just replicating the pages. Um, so what you tend to find there is in Search Console, you'll get the uh, Google chose different canonical. I can't remember the exact phrases, like declared canonical, Google chose different or something like that. That's essentially Google looking at the free versions of the page and kind of going, yeah, it's the same value proposition, it's the same content, it's the same language. I'm just going to ignore this and canonicalize the first one. So with that, you want to make small changes. And when I say small, it could even be the case of header changes, change up some testimonials, just slight differences. So when Google looks at it, face value goes, ah, this page is tailored for the German market, this one's tailored for the Austrian market, and this one's tailored for German, uh, Swiss, uh, sorry, Swiss German speakers. Um, but with canonicals and hreflang, you want to make sure there's no conflicts or mismatches there because that can also break hreflang mappings as well. Awesome. Let's take one more question. Um, that's an interesting one. Katarina, I recently purchased a domain that was previously associated with a spammy website. What do you do? Um, so with this, I think it's two faults. If it was associated with a spammy website and the website was spammy, it depends on how much downtime that has had. And when we go into kind of theoretical, if it was spammy and it received a penalty, then the penalty will be associated with the domain. If the penalty has been lifted, then it's lifted. It just don't do anything to trigger it. I'm now going to go into a bit of theoretical here because technically, if you redirect one domain to another, for example, Google has said that after 180 days, all value from domain A will have been passed to domain B through the redirect. So in theory, the redirect can be broken. If, in theory, that's because of that status code. So by theory, if it's been more than 180 days where the URL was not, a, not, not mapped to a DNS, not attached to anything that resolved in a 200, or just resolving something different, that connection in theory could be broken, but that's completely theoretical. The secondary question to this is if the domain is, if, you, if your spammy domain did something like, uh, no, pet food, and you're creating a website to sell pet food in the same niche, in the same everything else, then that could carry some weight because that domain's already been associated with spam tactics in that sector. But that's not necessarily to say that you can't recover it. Seven, eight years ago, when Google was handing out penguin penalties quite hard, it was possible to recover from them, and you could recover and build significant brands off it. I would just make sure you're doing everything right, and doing everything by the book. Depending on what kind of spam it was, if it was things like link spam, you probably don't need to disavow the links, but if it helps put you at rest, I'd disavow some of those links and pull it from a historic backlink history and something like Majestic, but... As long as you're building rights on it and a penalty doesn't exist or there was no penalty, you should be okay. But then again, the only other downside is if it was a, a website which has been slandered in the forums for being a fake site or something like that, then that's a brand issue. And then you probably need to work on fresh PR, fresh branding, etc. Awesome. Dan, thank you so much. It was a great presentation as all of the presentations here today so far. Uh, I think we're going to move on to the next segment. If uh, this, people that still have questions, contact Dan directly, please. I assume that's okay. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Thank you for having me, Chris. And thank you, everyone, cool. for 
let me be here. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. Welcome back, Juliana, SEO Joe Blogs. Um, I think we have time for, let's have a really good question here. So when you change the URL of a page, what implications does that have? Is that advisable? Should you do that all the time? Uh, what are your thoughts about changing URLs? Okay, about changing URLs, I would say you do need to really assess to see what are you changing it from to to. So if you're just trying to remove, I don't know, a an and or a the, I would say not bother. And that ties in with uh, what the news went out um, earlier regarding, um, I think John Mueller was saying, you know, it's not worth uh, it's not worth sort of um, changing URLs. You know, you'd be lucky to end up in the same place after changing URLs. Um, so really, I would only change URLs if you really needed to. So if you're going, you know, migrating to maybe um, an actual a folder, if you're going to different markets, or if you've taken over from maybe uh, an older website, like um, I think Dan was mentioning earlier maybe you've got a new website and you want to change some URLs perfect but I would actually just assess how much effort it is to change those URLs versus what you're going to get back before you do that I completely agree so actually we went through this process we had a great mm -hmm. blog post about SEO packages you know in 2021 or 20 something like that so it's still ranked well for SEO packages related keywords but we want to make it like a pillar page like an evergreen page so we completely updated that page. We changed the URL. It took a solid, I would say, at least two months until, you know, we started to gain traction. It's doing now really well. But yes, it took a long time. So that's a, yeah, you have to weigh the, you know, pros and cons of, um, you know, changing URLs. And actually a question that came up earlier that I'd love to get your thought on. Um, if you get hit by negative backlinks, what do you do? Is that still a thing? Yeah, I believe it could still be a thing. I mean, if you have seen that you haven't changed anything major to your site and suddenly perhaps um, you've noticed a... Uh, uh, a hit so your rankings have dropped for example um and you're not appearing in the first first few pages of uh, the search engines then yes i would do a review but i would do a review anyway of your links it's good just you know as part of a, a cleanup just to sort of review okay what links have we got coming to our site now um what links do we want to have coming to our site um, it's also a good way to sort of view the market. You know, what are your competitors doing? So I would review this uh, regularly. And if you are doing this regularly, let's say every quarter, every six months, then you can actually see if you have been hit by um, maybe not a person selling not a links to you. Yeah. All right. Well, we are on to our next presentation. Juliana, thanks so much. Um, you have great information on your blog. Uh, this was a pleasure hosting this little chit chat in between the presentations here. With that Thank being you. said, we are moving on to Rechoice or Yaku, how to SEO optimize content briefs. Thank you very much, everyone. Look forward to the next uh, talks. See you later. Joyce, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Where are you located? Um, London. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Um, you're going to tackle a very interesting topic that I'm personally very interested in as well. 
content briefs very important part of an seo strategy why don't you briefly introduce yourself before we dive into the presentation here yeah, of course. Um, so I'm Rejoice. I am an SJ specialist and content strategist. Um, been doing SJ for about five years. Um, also the co-founder of Be Digital UK. Um, I mostly specialize in like content optimizations and sort of looking at you know expertise within um, you know diversity and inclusion and all of those great things. All right, excellent. Let's dive into your presentation. Awesome. Yeah, so I'll be talking about how to SEO optimize your content briefs, mostly looking at um, the best possible ways for your content briefs to sort of adhere to SEO best practices, just so that we are, you know, giving our freelancers, our copywriters a great chance to write quality content. Um, so essentially, the objectives for today is to learn what a content brief is and why is, is it needed and what's important. And um, also to highlight the different elements that we can actually add into our content brief to, again, reinforce to copywriters or even to the clients that these are the things we're going to cover and sort of sharing where we're utilizing keywords. And again, you know, have some tips left over for how to work well within with um, freelancers and copywriters and as well any other tips that we need to be thinking about when we're creating those content briefs. So we're going to start the what, essentially, what is a content brief? Um, so according to, you know, use topic, a content brief is essentially a document that allows you um, to communicate with your writers about um, the topic or what you want them to sort of produce. It helps them understand what you want from them out of the content um, and how you want it to be done. So highlighting the different areas that you want them to sort of either change or create or add to all of those things. So the reason why, you know, a content brief is needed, because again, we don't want to be spending our time with a lot of back and forth with our copywriters or whether it's internal or external. We want to be able to approach SEO in a proper manner. And without content briefs, we open ourselves to kind of, you know, have that incorrect approach towards SEO and therefore having to sort of having to edit the content so heavily it should be a seamless process and you know having that content brief it allows it doesn't allow the room for misunderstandings you are able your writers are able to know exactly what you're trying to get out of this exactly um you know the approach you're trying to take and really and truly why and you know you know the purpose of creating this content and what it's going to be used for so what makes a content brief seo focused so essentially it's you know, it creates this unique goal for us to sort of instruct um, our content using a targeted and specific search query. Um, a lot of times the briefs will be sort of um, wrapped around one particular query that we're trying to sort of create. And from that, we can definitely start building onto topic clusters or, or query clusters for us to have a better understanding. But essentially, uh, making the SEO focus allows us to ensure that we are either targeting the right intent, creating content that fits the right consumer um, journey um, that our users are found in. So what are the benefits and you know, why should we really care to make our content with SEO focus? And one of the reasons being is that it can minimize our costings. So you don't want to spend a lot of time paying for revisions over and over again because it wasn't clearly communicated that there needs to be an SEO focus onto it. Again, it helps improve search rankings because we are making the content very user-centric, very user-focused by ensuring that we're hitting that right intent, as I said earlier. We are increasing consistency. So over time, if you're working with long-term freelancers or you have a long-term in-house copywriters, they will start to understand the, the standards used. So there'll be consistency in how we're producing content, consistency in how that content is being laid out, how that content is sort of being looked at, and consistency 
in thinking forward and thinking about SEO. And it allows us to hit deadlines on time. Because we have our briefs, our briefs should be clear and very concise. We can hit the deadlines. We minimize, again, that back and forth so we can spend our time um, editing and just sort of making sure it's right. It's, you know, the reading is right. It's, you know, the language used, the tone of voice are all met. All of those things that we need to do, the checks we need to do afterwards gets done quicker because we have that content brief that reinforce that SEO. It also allows us to educate writers and our clients. Sometimes writers are not um, SEO savvy. So it allows them to sort of learn in terms of SEO and educate why this particular content should be attributed to a particular intent based on the keywords. It allows us to create scalable formats. So again, a lot of website, a lot of clients, um, the way that in which they built their blog pages or whether it's their product pages um, have a particular template. So if we're having or creating content briefs that follows a certain format, we can scale it up. We don't have to constantly having to produce or we or you know find new formats for particular blogs. It's you know it's perfectly fine to have a particular content brief template for several types of um, formatting that the website has or the website structure is made on. It also um, instantly deduplicate anything that we do. So again, because the content briefs is um, aligned to a certain topic, aligned to a certain intent or consumer journey, we are not duplicating content. So we are always remembering, always knowing that what content we've produced and for what purpose we've produced it. And it's always useful to sort of, again, having a very organized um, sort of content bank that you, you can go to and ensure that these are the topics that we, we have created, especially when within that content breeze, we have the article um, title or the, or the meta title and description that way we're ensuring that we're not actually regurgitating the same meta title and meta description and again faster delivery um, a lot of the freelancers prefer very concise briefs and um, they can get straight to it they know exactly what to use what internal links we're trying to use the tone of voice of the approximation of words to use and they can deliver it much faster again we're hitting that deadline quite early so we've all heard about the Google quality content, um, but in a, in a very cool way, it does apply to content briefs. And I think we have to consider content briefs into quality content. Now, John Mueller talks about quality content, not just being about the text of your articles, but it's really about the overall site. And that can include from anything from layout and design and you know how we're presenting our page and or, or the images that we're using. But when we talk about quality content, people assume that we're only talking about content that follows um, the EAT um, algorithm. But really and truly, we should be focusing on layout, design, imagery, and page speed. But then the question is, okay, so knowing all of this, how does this then apply to content briefs? And what should we take away from this when we're trying to create the content briefs? Like we said earlier, it is more about, it's, you know, it's more to do um, from the text. It's, it's about layout. And sometimes layouts can be layouts in which we have laid our website. And also, if you're creating blogs, the layout of the blogs, the layout in the formatting, the readability of all of these things, these add to the quality content. So when we're talking about quality content, we're going to have to talk about quality content briefs. And the reason being is that your quality content briefs or the briefs in itself should be helpful. It should be useful to the reader. So they should be able to know when you're writing that brief, you should always ask yourself, will this brief, when written, will it answer the intent of the user? Does it actually follow what the user wants to know, wants to see? Is it factual? Do you have some facts in there? Do you have some citations that you want to inform your writer that include the citation and here is the link for it? Do you have some um, figures that you want to quote, again, that you're informing in your content briefs? And again, how is the content briefs, how does it show that it's interesting? How does this topic um, allude to interest when we're talking about our users? And is it authentic? Are we using the right tone of voice? Um, is it an informal um, co um, content brief that you're trying to create? Is it a technical? And how are we breaking that down? Again, we have to think about it being user-centric. When you're creating the content brief, you should create it in the sense of, if you're the reader and you're going through this, you know, when it's written, 
will this actually does this take you in mind does it take you into consideration is is does the flow of the content briefs does it make sense to you is it comprehensive so have you make sure that content brief has every ever information the writer will need to know that is important to the users and also important to the um you know the writer as well and how original is it are you talking about an original um, topic is a content brief going to highlight an original article even if you are sort of you know it is a very known or famous topic how have you made it unique to your brand or unique to the client how have you made this content different to what is out there and is it relevant the relevancy is down to the keywords you're using the keywords you're targeting how is the the base of the content relevant to the targeted keyword or the description or the intent all of these things are what we should be thinking about when we're thinking of quality content we have to be thinking about these sort of categories to ensure our briefs follow suit now we're going to go into the how. So how do we actually create this? What, what are the elements that we need to add, we need to join together when we're creating content briefs? Well, we know all of these information that we need to include. We need to include our meta title, our meta description, our external or internal links. We need to consider the format and the outline and so many things, even down to the word count. Um, and all of this will, I will break it down into what type of elements or what questions we should be asking when we're creating that content briefs to ensure those things are, are right. So let's start with keyword and search intent. So search intent is you want to communicate the type of interaction the user is likely looking for. So it can be, it can be informational, it can be transactional, commercial um, in nature. So you need to understand for this content brief or the content that we're looking to create, what is the intent that we want, that we think the user actually wants to find out based on this keyword that we're going to use or based on the topic that we're going to discuss? From there, you can now look at the, you know, what keyword's going to use. Again, the main goal of SEO content it is to rank, um, but it also is to um, ensure that our users feel heard, feel listened to, um, and you do want to drive organic traffic. We cannot forget the purpose of displaying web content online. Um, you know, you you want to make sure that keyword is relevant, and don't be afraid to add in a secondary keywords, secondary keywords that tells your writer, you know, this is the targeted keyword we want to use, but here are a few more that are aligned with the topic and are aligned with the um, with the overarching targeted keyword that we want to use. Have a section or create a, a mini table that calls out title, meta title, keywords, secondary keywords, just so that when your writers are going into the briefs, they are already aware of the of you know the line of thinking that you're going down in. So for title tags and meta description, this again should also inform intent in, in its own way. It's basically you're previewing how search engines or searchers will see it listed within search engines. So again, you do want to tell your writers that this is a this is the meta title and description that we're going for, because what they can use that as is as, as a cue in terms of tone of voice, in terms of you know the expectations or the the briefing about what this content is going to be about. And don't forget that it needs to still meet SEO best practices. So following the character length and all of those things. And it is okay to put in the character length within the brief. Again, the purpose of content briefs is we're also trying to educate our copywriters just so that we create this habit of SEO focused content, again, to make sure that we have inconsistency. So competitor examples. Now, when I used to sort of write content briefs, I would always add in competitor examples um, just to sort of inform the, the writer that, hey, you know, this is uh, a competitor that basically has this, the same thinking that we have, we're having for our blogs. It could be based on format. It could be based on based on tone of voice, or it could be based on the level of detail um, that has gone into it. So it's absolutely okay to show the competitive examples that use this as a reference, um, refer to articles that already rank for your targeted keywords. And that's a good way you need to do. So take your targeted keywords, put it, in, put it into a search engine, 
and copy the top three and refer to it, refer to um, your writers and say they already ran for it, you know, following the level of detail or the outline or the tone of voice. We want to sort of mimic that, but ensure we are adding original and authentic value in our own way. And then you want to ask yourself, how can you make your piece more valuable? Again, it's not about regurgitating what others have done, but it's about showing your uniqueness. What is so different about the content you're going to write? What additional information are you going to give them? Add that into the content brief. Now, internal and external links are super, super important. Again, um, what's great about content briefs is, and, and I do suggest this, is if you are working quite closely with the digital PR team, for example, and they have done publications or they have acquired links that your client or your brand was mentioned in, um, and you are now creating a content that is very much similar to what you know what that um, PR campaign was about. You can speak to your digital PR team and, and acquire those external links just so you can reference them within the article that you're creating or reference them within the content briefs. Um, and that's a, a good way for, again, to sort of create synergy between the two teams and work quite well together. And maybe you can share external links and bank that you can utilize and, you know, maybe categorize it by theme. So when you're creating that content briefs, you can always remember, oh, we, we have, a, you know, a digital PR campaign that we've secured a link for. Maybe we can use that as an external link. And the whole point of sort of creating external links is, you want to build out authority that supports the information that you're using. So this is why I said, you know, having a factual um, stats, you know, citations, adding it into your content briefs allows your writer to use it as a referencing point to support your topic relevancy, your authority of that information. And by sharing it, um, the resources with your readers as well, it is similar like going back to school and writing an essay where you have to sort of call out all the citations and the references you've used. Sometimes with quite technical pieces or technical content briefs, we, we need to do that. We need to make sure that we're seen as authority, especially if you're within the your money, your life type of um, companies or you're writing for those type of um, um, information or content calling out the resources that you're using to get the information from or adding citations, they go a long way. And if we want that, we need to add that to the content briefs. When it comes to internal linking, again, focus on relevancy. Focus on what is relevant within your site that we can add to it. If you're an e-commerce page and you sell, I don't know, makeup and you know, you're talking about Christmas, if you have a category that talks about red lipstick, Get that category link, add that as an internal link. It's building the relevancy or it's bu building the um, the information for the client so or the users so they can see how linked the whole um, in the whole content is. And adding that, adding a section for internal, external links, again, your writers or freelancers will greatly appreciate it. So suggested word count and CTAs. Um, so word count, um, you know, Dep just basically saying how long this blog post would be but I would emphasize going a bit further if you're splitting it out into for the h1 the mini paragraph here and there's a mini paragraph after the h2 I would for each paragraph maybe call out um uh the word count there for each paragraph so you know the first paragraph should it be 500 words 400 words again giving your writers more guidance will allow them to be a lot more specific in how they write it um so check out what your competitors are doing there is a really cool um you know a chrome extension tool if when i'm doing competitors research it's called word count plus and basically allows you to copy the entire site and kind of gauge the word count it displays the word count so you can kind of see okay here's a rough amount just so you have a baseline to work with um, it also give ideas in terms of costings. So if you're so going to work with a freelancer and you know they charge per word in or they charge per word, it gives you an idea of the cost. So you can plan ahead and budget accordingly. Um, and ideally, it should also start to indicate the length of the topic. So certain, certain topics will require a longer word count and other topics won't. So having that word count there can help you kind of reinforce the habit over time. And most importantly, call to actions. So call to actions are quite unique um, because they allow a, a, a really great balance in terms of whether we're targeting transactional keywords. Do you want your users to book now? 
or inquire or explore more. All of these things are call to actions and there's different ways you could have a call to action. It makes you think about what do you want your user to do with this information? What action do you want them to take? And also, realistically, what actions do you think they're going to take or they're willing to take? Um, so if, for example, you are creating a, a blog that is based around the awareness um, awareness life cycle, um, most likely you wouldn't use a book now because you know, you understand your users are there to learn more information. They're not ready to purchase. But if you are creating a, a content brief for a article that reinforces, you know, purchase or post-purchase or decision making, then you know the kind of CTAs to use is whether it's book now, buy now, um, you know, all of these things. So again, you you can start to sort of know and see where it's appropriate to add a call to action. Um, and adding it to the brief helps be more realistic about your buyer's journey. Formatting an outline, this is very useful. I think, you know, how you format and outline anything, because again, some blogs are formatted really wrong, but the information is great. But because the formatting is weird, users can be quite put off. So you don't want that to happen. So you want to ensure your content briefs are formatted exactly the way you would want it to be formatted once, once it's written out. So the outline can be as detailed um, as simply requiring them to fill in the gaps between the headers and subheaders. So that's essentially what I do. So when I'm creating a, a brief about a uh, an article that I want to be written, if we take in something like, um, uh, I don't know, a beauty brand, I would have a H1, I would have a H2, and then underneath it, I might have a H3, and I'll actually add in the, the headings, the titles that I want them to, to sort of use. Again, this should go with the research. Look at how your competitors are formatting what they're doing um, and how the outline is. So the outline um, sort of dispels any fears of blank pages being created or random um, works being put in. It kind of gives the reader or gives the um, writer a good skeleton in how you want it to look. Um, and that goes for the structuring of the content, um, you know, where you want them to input the keywords. And um, sometimes I will go as far as per section. I would say for the section, can we target the keyword and you write whatever keywords you want? For the section, can we ensure this internal link is added and go as further to say, can an, can an anchor text of be added here so little things you're informing them what anchor text to use what head um, internal link to use within that formatting so now that we understand what goes into seo um content briefs how you know we're going to talk about a few tips here and there that you can take away with you so essentially keywords are great so you know we know that the algorithm but allows um, us to understand semantics behind any search queries so don't forget your keywords in your in, in your briefs as well it's great if you want to add a section um, in the beginning of your briefs to call out the audience if you understand the different audience um, of your brand or your clients whether they are homeowners whether they are young people call it out tell the writer in your content briefs our audience are young people between the age of this and that. That will help you reinforce the language, the tone of voice, the topics or the structuring of it. Again, it's very important to understand the persona of, this, of the person you're trying to write for. Again, outline is also fine to include H1s and H2s. Like I said earlier, call out which title is a H1, call out which title is a H2 and point out within each section where you will want an asset, an image to be added. And, you know, if you are also send this to a client, maybe highlight that particular area where you're asking them for an asset, highlight it in a different color. So once your um, the client sees it, they know where that asset will be added and they know what asset is needed. So you can actually write, we need an image of X, you know, this hairstyle or that hairstyle of this person, that person. Just be as clear as you can. Links, so list out any URLs on the sites that mention your topic. Again, it's very good to have a balance between um, internal links being maybe category pages and also informational content. So we want to be going back to what other, does this fit the theme of um, previous blogs 
that this brand, the client has written before? If so, let's find those relevant um, um, links and add it into it. Subtopic. So ensure the writer covers every subtopic. What I like to do within my briefs is um, before I start doing the structuring, I'll add a section um, in terms of questions. And then I will type in the kind of questions I sort of want the blog to answer in a way um, that I think would be quite useful. So the writer would know, okay, these are the kind of questions that we need this information, we need this content to answer that is relevant to the overarching topic. And think about your funnel stage. You know, if you're B2B and you're writing about, um, you know, the awareness stage or within the awareness stage, when you're creating your content brief, think about the tofu, the mofu and the bofu, and that will help you categorize all your keywords. So then you understand where you're putting what keyword, what keyword makes sense, um, the type of pages we need to link to and all of those things. Um, so this is just a what you what you have to avoid. Um, avoid suggestions after the fact, um, because again, if you are paying per word, any revisions could cost you. So make sure your content briefs are concise, are clear. Of course, you know questions can be asked here and there, but suggestions of changes are just avoid it. Again, it elongates the timings. Don't always focus on high search volume um, because sometimes the lower search volumes tends to be more long tail queries and they have a more obvious intent. So make, mix and match from high to low um, or, um, or always. And it's fine to maybe have a section that explains your, to explains your rationale just so your clients or your freelancers could understand your rationale behind creating this content. Um, tools are good but not perfect. So um, great tools that you can use to sort of help you in terms of looking how to structure your brief. SEMrush has a great topic tool. Um, you know, ClearScope has a great um, um, content briefs tool. Any tool that allows you to look at um, topic relevancies or topic clusters, those tools are great. Um, and those tools are really, really good to use. Um, SC Ranking has a great keyword um, tool, tool that you can see what's ranking for your site, what's ranking for a particular page or particular landing page that you need to maybe repurpose the content for or create new content for. Um, involve your content team. So if you're an SEO person, you have a separate content marketing team, involve them, bring them into that planning process um, so that they can understand these are what the content you're creating, understand why you're creating it. So again, you're, you're adding that educational factor. Um, as SEOs and people who do love SEO, we want to keep educating people at SEO. It makes our jobs a lot easier if people already understand SEO. Um, don't hold back in showing results. So once you sort of create that content brief and you send it out and you see great results from that content being produced, share it, share it with the content team. Because again, it gives you more of a credibility as to why this process of creating SEO focused content briefs is needed. Um, and you know, it, people love to see results. People love to brag. So why not? And as well, when you're involving the content briefs and um, content team, respect your knowledge. Yes, we're SEOs, but if they have a process that you can um, create a synergy with, respect their knowledge, respect what they know about consumer behavior or consumer needs or brand strategy, respect all of those because we're going to need that insight just so we can understand much better how to sort of prepare our content briefs. And that's me. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Rejoice. Thank you so much, man. If everybody would follow your advice, the world would be a better place. Thank you. Um, why don't we take one question here? Rejoice, how long does it take you to create a content brief? Just like how long does this process take? Um, for me, the process definitely takes um, on, a, on a great day. An hour. An hour. <laughs> on a great day, an hour, because I think um, maybe for me, I have been doing it for a while. So I'm very much used to the process of competitive research, finding things. And I think what would help is before you before you start write, writing the briefs, maybe on an Excel sheet, all the all the categories you know you need to fill out, just have those as headers and just be inputting those information. So when the brief comes and you need to do the formatting. You don't have to go back on to Google to search. You have that there, just copy and paste it. So that could quicken up the process. But if you're new to it, 
maybe an hour and maybe an hour to two hours i think you can get a, a brief done but the more you go at it the less time it's going to take for you cool and so you know you mentioned some tools um SE Ranking recently launched a content marketing set, yes. which includes the content editor. Man, this is basically what you talked about. Yeah. yeah. We are using the content editor. I'll actually showcase it in my presentation. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. I think with your advice and tools such as uh, SE Ranking content editor, um, you will get the message across to the writer. Last question. Um, how much do you want to restrict a writer in terms of, hey, you have to use these keywords or you have to write like this for SEO? Mm -hmm. What's your advice on that? So you can, so again, it's not every single section you need to tell them that utilize this keyword. Um, you can still give the writers a bit more free range by letting them know, you know, for example, you can ask them to sort of create the heading, the heading titles for each and each section. They have free reign to do that. But it's up to you. Sometimes when you need it to be a specific way, unfortunately, they don't have that creative agency. But sometimes you can sort of give them it, it really down to the the um, companies or clients you work for. I've mostly ever worked with e-commerce and e-commerce and retail. Um, they like fashion brands, beauty brands. So there's a lot more free reign the writers can sort of use and the tone of voice. Um, but if you're more B2B, more technical, I guess the writers kind of are a bit more restricted in terms of this is the information we need. These are the factual stats we need. But it, it, it's really down up to you what you think is best. And again, a lot of writers are happy to essentially be told how you want it because they avoid the, the back and forth and the incorrect workings. Cool. Before we tackle the next topic, which I'm going to present, a uh, quick reminder, we're doing giveaways, uh, three awesome hoodies uh, and three subscriptions to the uh, Essentials 500 plan. So please, please, please uh, publish something on social media. Make sure to tag SE Ranking in that post. There can be a quote, a screenshot, a whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, make sure you have a chance to win one of those giveaways. That said, Rejoice, thank you so much for your time. That thank was you. awesome. Next up, myself. All right. Uh, by now, by now, I think most of you guys know me. I'm a, my name is uh, Chris Rolf. I'm the founder of Boulder SEO Marketing. We're a boutique, hyper-focused SEO agency here in beautiful Boulder, Colorado. I'm going to talk about, hey, don't fall behind in corporate AI, artificial intelligence, into your SEO strategy now. Uh, I'm originally from Switzerland, moved to uh, Boulder, Colorado in Gosh, 96, uh, absolutely love it here. There's amazing skiing, biking, hiking, what not. I've been in digital marketing SEO for about 25 years now. Uh, I'm an uh, in international uh, keynote speaker and a bit of an SEO nerd. Enough about myself. Uh, we're going to try to cover quite a bit in the next short 20 minutes. What is AI? Why should uh, you include AI in SEO? Uh, then we'll take a look how uh, micro SEO strategies, it's a proprietary SEO methodology that we developed here at uh, Boulder SEO Marketing. How can you combine them with SE rankings, SEO and AI tools? to create amazing results. Then we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into the SE ranking, SEO and AI tools. We'll take a look at the process that we use to get to the top in Google for one specific location page. And then I'll show you the results that we achieved with that strategy using micro SEO strategies and SE rankings, SEO and AI tools. And then uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit time for Q&A before we move on to the next presenter. All right, let's get to it. Uh, so why don't we quickly talk about what is AI? So I found this great definition on the SAS.com uh, website. AI is the science of training machine to perform human tasks. Okay. 
it's nothing magical. It's basically a process where we train machines to assist us humans in doing a task better and more efficient, right? AI applies machine learning, deep learning, and other techniques to solve actual problems. If you work in SEO, you know we have to solve a lot of problems. So this is why I highly recommend get on it, make AI part of your SEO strategy. Uh, as many of you know, uh, AI became a big part of Google's algorithm back in October of 2015 when Google unleashed RankBrain. And ever since, uh, Google incorporated more AI into its algorithm, uh, helpful content, BERT, MOM, etc., etc. This is why the Google algorithm is improving dramatically. So why not also take advantage of AI in our SEO strategy? All right. So what you're seeing here is uh, what we call the SEO strategy framework. It's a very simplified version of the SEO strategy that we deploy for our customers. As part of the June 30th, 2021 spam core algorithm update, our own website got hit, rightfully so. We didn't update our website, I think, for like three years because we were so busy helping clients with their SEO. We got hit. We got hit hard. Um, so we had to go back to the drawing board and really rethink how we do SEO, not only for our clients, but also for ourselves. Right. So we took a look at every process, you know, that we're doing keyword research, keyword mapping, like technical SEO, uh, UX, all that good stuff. And as we're uh, creating this process, we're now thinking about you know, where can we potentially use AI to make our process more efficient, all right? Not only to speed up things, but also to get better results in terms of SEO. If you're an agency, you know, uh, or if you're a freelancer, there are hundreds of things that we need to do as part of a SEO strategy. My recommendation is take a look at every one of these processes, see where you can add an AI component. All right. So why you need to incorporate AI into your SEO strategy now? Well, you simply cannot afford not doing it. It is truly a competitive advantage, uh, as I'll show you in this presentation. And then if you're an agency, it's very simple. Your customers will expect it from you. It's that simple. In our proposal, we have now a section where we talk about, hey, dear client, we use AI technology as part of our overall SEO strategy. But rest assured, we don't just rely on AI to do the job for us. It is a human-driven, AI-assisted approach, all right? So I think we're right at the beginning of the hockey stick, uh, at the very beginning of this revolution of AI. It's going to evolve so fast moving forward. Uh, we can't just rely on AI tools for now as a standalone process. It has to be a human-driven approach. But I think as, as longer as um, you know these tools are around, the more we can rely on certain tools to help us with this process. All right. Optimizing an entire website takes forever. Um, let me take a step back. This is why we invented micro SEO strategies. After our website got hit, we had to get results very fast because we lost about 80 or 90% of our organic search traffic. I'll tell you, it was scary. It was, it was very, very bad. Like my business partner and I, we were like thinking, what are we going to do? Oh my God, do we have to do outbound now? Uh, which I'm not a fan of. 
so develop, we developed micro SEO strategies. It's basically the process of identifying a page on your website that already ranks well for a keyword that has high intent, appropriate search volume, but it's currently not at the very top in Google. So it's a low hanging fruit um, page that we believe we can improve so much and prove to Google that this is the best page on the web that we deserve to be at the top in Google. All right, that's basically in a nutshell what micro SEO strategies are. As part of this process, we use SE rankings, SEO and AI tools. We're going to talk about the competitive research tool, the keyword research tool, the SERP analyzer tool on SE ranking. And then we're also going to talk about the content editor tool that I mentioned briefly before. It's a brand new tool on the SE ranking platform. And then we're also going to talk about the on page SEO checker tool. All right. So here's the process. Basically, once we got hit um, by this core algorithm update, we used SE Rankings competitive research tool. We plugged the website into the tool there and we wanted to see are there any interesting keywords that have a high search volume and high intent where related to a page that we could optimize. All right. So we did identify the, it was actually the Denver SEO location page. I think the keyword was uh, Denver SEO company or Denver SEO agency. We were at position 12, right? Nobody goes to page two on Google. However, we believed that by applying the micro SEO strategy and using the tools that we're using, we can get that page to the top in Google so that we can get leads again. All right, so we use the uh, competitive research tool to identify that low hanging fruit keyword and page. Then we head over to the keyword research tool on SE ranking because I want to know how many people are searching for set keyword. Okay, in this case, Denver SEO company, a thousand people are searching for this keyword. Denver is actually a massive market. A lot of tech companies are here. It's, it's a very, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great place for new businesses. A lot of people apparently are searching for Denver SEO companies. All right, I wanna know, is it achievable? How much are people paying uh, on a cost per click basis? I wanna see what are related keywords, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we use the SE ranking keyword research tool to identify our target SEO keywords, all right? As you can see here, we selected three primary target SEO keywords, Denver SEO company, a thousand people are searching for this keyword. We were at position 10, does not cut it. Denver SEO agency, a little bit less, we're at position 11. SEO services, Denver, less people, but very high intent. Again, we were on page two. Then secondary primary keywords, SEO agency, Denver, Denver SEO agencies, the plural, and Denver SEO services. So these were the, th the six keywords that we made part of that micro SEO strategy for the Denver SEO location page. All right, next step, we went over to the SE ranking SERP analyzer tool. Hey, what is our competition? Who do we have to beat? How many backlinks do they have? How much content is on that page, et cetera, et cetera. The tool allows you to select or deselect um, listings such as, what is it, clutch, a directory. Um, so I would probably deselect this uh, listing because it's not as applicable as a competitor. All right. Moving on to the next tool here. Then we went over to the SE ranking content editor tool. All right, simply plug in the keywords that you're targeting, the select the region. 
that you want to be found for, uh, for those keywords uh, in that page. Then um, it's very intuitive. Simply move on, go to the organic competitors section. Again, here you can select or deselect who you want to get uh, data about. Again, I would probably deselect the directory there, Clutch. But uh, try to figure out how do you compete against actual competitors in the SERPs. Next step, uh, define the content parameters and the terms of use, basically. How long, how short does this uh, piece of content need to be? There's a lot of parameters. Unfortunately, I cannot cover all of them. And then the tool allows you to add additional keywords that you may want to make part of the content that you're going to put up on that page. Then it takes you over to the content structure. This is basically the content brief, right? Where you can take a look at all those competitors. What have they on their pages? You know, what's in their H1, H2, H3 tags, etc. So you basically, this tool allows you to create a content brief. Then this is the next screen. So basically the tool then plugs in the sections that you selected. And really cool, if you hover, let's say over top SEO companies in Denver, you can right click, the tool will pre-populate content as you can see there on the right side that you could, you know, plug into the content development, WYSIWYG editor there. I highly recommend, make sure a human uh, takes a look at the content, edits it, etc. But this tool tr is amazing. We love it. It makes our job so much easier over here at Boulder SEO Marketing. And then what we do, so basically we use the tool, right, to develop the content brief. And then we do a process called SEO design, where we go to the whiteboard. We take a look at, uh, hey, how do we want to design this page now? Uh, what should it look like visually? All right. And then we send it over to our designers, our writers now develop the content based on the recommendations that we get from the content editor tool. And then basically the result was uh, it's a very long page. Uh, I made four screenshots here. This is ultimately what the Denver SEO location page looks like. It has a ton of information that not only Google wants to see, but also people. And then uh, we let this page run for about a month. Then we plug it into the SE ranking on page SEO checker tool. Because there's always things that you can improve. As you can see there, uh, we get a 65 on the left side, uh, left side, a 65 out of 100. So this tool now tells you, hey, you may want to think about improving these things. Um, then we go back to the drawing board, re-optimize that page. And this allows us now to get from position, you know, let's say 6, 5, 4 to position 1, 2, and 3. Proof is in the pudding. This page now ranks for nearly 300 uh, keywords, including um, keywords such as Denver SEO, uh, Denver SEO agency, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see there, after we optimized that page, uh, it went from like 38 hits per month to nearly 300 per month. So we saw an increase in organic search traffic by 800 to 1,000%. And it saved us. It now generates so many leads. We can pick and choose who we want to work with. So micro SEO strategies and uh, SE rankings, SEO and AI tools really saved us. Um, yeah. If you want to learn more about micro SEO strategies, um, my business partner, Daniel Burns, and I, we actually gave an hour-long presentation at SC Ranking. It's on the YouTube channel available. Outrank any competitor with micro SEO strategies. Yeah. If you want to learn more about SC Ranking, try the extended free trial. I think you guys are going to get all the slides here. Woo! 
over just in time all right i think we're gonna move on to the next presentation i don't want to take time away from the next presenter here but we'll have another uh, segment where we tackle news again so i'll be happy to answer uh, specific questions about uh, micro seo strategies and the se ranking tools all right thank you very much All right, Sarah, are you there? Yep. <laughs> Sorry to have taken a little bit of your time. Uh, no worries at all. All right, let's. Why don't we get right into it, Sarah? If you want to briefly introduce yourself, and then we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to uh, see your presentation. Yep. Sure. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Super excited to be here as well. Uh, I've been doing SEO for eight years. Uh, I work both agency side and client side. Uh, I've also worked with big businesses, small businesses, international brands, and I'm super excited to be here today. Awesome. Yep. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about Entity SEO. Um, it's such a big, big topic. And um, the reason I picked that topic is that I found that most of the content about Entity SEO is more about the theory part more than the tactical and execution part. So today I'll do my best to make sure you understand what is an entity and why it's important, how to incorporate that into your uh, SEO workflows and to have the right mindset to approach content moving forward. So before I keep talking about entity, entity all the time, I wanted to make sure we understand we have um, a, a, an established uh, ground of what an entity is. So an entity, as per Google's definition, is a thing or concept that is singular, unique, well-defined, and distinguishable. Um, and uh, I would like to stress the, or, or highlight the concept that it, about, about being singular. So for example, if you search on Google for a book, versus searching for books, you get very much a, 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 a somewhat different results. If you search for a celebrity versus celebrities, you get different results. Um, and and um, again, so an entity can be a person, a place, an item, an idea. It can be, uh, it doesn't have to be a physical thing. The, uh, I've seen people define entities as anything that has a Wikipedia page. Uh, but uh, I think the best definition or the best way to identify an entity is just if it's a noun or not linguistically. Um, this graph you see there, this is something I just um, brainstormed. Every single yellow circle there is, a, is, a, is an entity, right? Uh, and it, this graph shows the connection between entities, right? And, and this is a very simple basic example of um, a, a semantic network or what we are going to be talking about today as well, a knowledge graph. So uh, an entity, some beauty can be like it can be an entity, but beautiful is not. Running shoes is an entity, but best running shoes is not. And uh, best running shoes is more about like a list of entities, right? Uh, a book is an entity. Books is not an entity. With that said, I will walk you through why we need to think of entities in the first place. Like what happened here? Like we were doing keyword research, and you know it was good. So why do we need to think about entities now? So actually, it's it's the concept of entities is not new. It's just more talked about today. So around 10 years ago or a bit more, the SERPs were filled with low quality results, things like keyword stuffing. So um, copied content, thin content and so on, a cloaking where the user sees content that's different from what the search engine sees and the version that search engine sees has so many uh, keyword stuffing, you know, in, in the same background, it, it, the text in the same color as the background. So um, Google wanted to move away from those tactics that can be easily manipulated to rank and therefore not providing users with the best results. So in 2011, Google launched or released the Panda update and it said that it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest uh, Google update to date. It did take a lot of business, business uh, websites out of business because it doubled down on any low quality content and rewarded quality content. While the SEO community was still recovering from Panda, 
Google striked again with the Penguin update. And that was more about Black Hat uh, SEO, um, Black Hat SEO link building tactics. And then in the same year, Google introduced a new concept, which is the, no the knowledge graph, right? And the purpose of that was, again, to move away from tactics that would be easily manipulated or easily um, used in a spammy way to manipulate search results. And then later on, Google released Hummingbird, which is more about search intent and so on. And a lot of things happened ever since. So with the introduction of the knowledge graph, Google wanted to be able to help the user better, right? To find the right things, get the best summary, and go deeper and broader. And what does that mean? So in that example, when we search for Diana, when was Diana born, right? You, you didn't mention any information about Diana. Who is Diana? Or like just Diana, right? So Google is able to know that you're talking about Princess of Wales, Princess Diana. It's able to get you the best summary and the best answer. And then it's also able to return related entities. If you go, if you look at the bottom, people also search for there's Charles, Queen Elizabeth, Prince Harry. These are all related entities. So that was the one of or or some of the main benefits of having a knowledge graph, right? So basically Google moved from moved to things not strings right so the concept was no more focus on words but the things right and real world entities so for example when you search for robert downey jr very famous actor on image search you will see that using image image search you'll see there are some entities returned below that are real, relevant to robert downey jr like avengers like uh, mark Raphael, right like um a lot of things right so um and that shows that these entities are connected for Google, right? Okay, so I want to give you an example of how Google approaches text to convert and convert it into a semantic network or a knowledge graph. So, for example, that's a, a text, a paragraph that can be on any page. Google analyze it and create the, a knowledge graph out of it, right? So this is why we basically need to consider thinking about content in a knowledge graph way because when google evaluates your content it's also going to use the knowledge graph it has um google also have uh one of the evidence of importance of entities is that google has um if you click on th those three dots in search on in search results about about res this result a while back it used to get to return um um a, a more information about why you are seeing this result. Why was this result selected? So, for example, when you search for how to cook fish in the fish in the oven, you would see, for example, the first the, because obviously the, this result has the keywords that you have in the query, but you also see that because this uh, the, this page has other words or other entities that are important to this query. For example, uh, ingredients, right? Uh, recipe. Uh, bacon. So things that are important to have in the page that are not in the keyword, right? So um, in other words, can you write a recipe without talking about ingredients? It doesn't make sense. You may be able to work around it. So the, the purpose is that when you write a, a topic, you want to make sure that you mention all the entities that Google think are relevant because it's important for Google because this will make your content more relevant and appear uh, and, and perform better in search. So you may be wondering, how does that look like? So let's take an example topic. Yeah, so let's take an example topic. Um, Road, road trip to Florida. So if you're doing uh, keyword research as usual, you would go about it like, OK, these are the keywords, road trip to Florida, Florida road trip, road uh, trip FL, which also stands for Florida. But if you're considering entities, you would add words like map, travel, itinerary, planner, right? And then another example, seven day Dubai itinerary, keywords would be the usual. Uh, Dubai itinerary, Dubai trip itinerary, seven day Dubai itinerary, Dubai itinerary seven days. Um, but if you're talking about entities, again, you're going to add some terms or entities, as we're talking about, that are not part of the keyword, like tour, Airbnb, tourist attraction. These, these 
terms need to be also on the page. And if you notice that keywords, they have to, they usually have similar similarities between them, right? Like road trip is in all the keywords, right? But for entities, they don't have the same words as the main topic or as the keywords. Okay, so with the introduction of entities, what does that mean for SEOs? It means few things. Um, first of all, spelling is not that important. Color and color in the, the American and the British um, um, spelling, it doesn't really matter. You, you don't need to go, oh, this, is, this has a higher search volume, I'm gonna use this one. Because Google knows that both mean the same thing, the same entity. Uh, keyword matrix. When we talk about density and how much uh, you repeat the same keyword, exact match keyword on the page, so buy shoes online, buy shoes online, buy shoes online, it's really rest less and less relevant now. It's more about the entire entity as a whole and how much thorough you are when you, when you cover a topic. Uh, variations. Google understands that, for example, Robert Downey Jr., the actor, is the sa is same as RDJ, which is his uh, nickname. Um, and then topical authority, this means that you cannot have actual uh, achieve topical authority without being able to um, have include entities. You cannot have topical authority without entities, right? Because entities help you go, go in depth and cover the topic as you should, like uh, thoroughly, thoroughly. Okay, now we know what an entity is, why we need to use entities, how do we do entity research? Um, there's someone asking, yes, I will show you how you can take advantage of entity SEO to grow your business. I have a, a case study uh, and it's, it's really, really awesome. So yeah, stay tuned. Um, as I showed the first uh, way, it's simplest way. First of all, there's a lot of automating, automated tools, but there are also other ways you can do that. So for example, you can search for um, a keyword or an, 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 or an entity, the ma your main entity, for example, and see what other um, entities are returned. And there are two things you need to take to, into consideration that you need to do this in cognito mode because you don't want personalized results. The second thing is that the, the, the data returned here or that list are, is a mix of search terms and entities. It's not all entities. So you'll need to like filter through it, note down relevant entities that you want to include in your content. Um, second thing you should try is going to Google Trends, pull related qu queries and uh, topics. Again, you'll need to filter through them and find, depending on what your entity is, find the relevant entities. Um, again, collect data from autocomplete and search suggestions. Uh, for example, for swimsuits, um, bathing suits is another entity, right? And um, it, it's actually another name for the same entity because Google probably knows that swimming suits is the same as bathing suits. So you can actually use both in the body of the content. Another uh, thing you can consider is going to Wikipedia. So for example, if you're writing uh, an article about Florida, you can search for Florida on Wikipedia, go to Florida page, and then uh, analyze, it, analyze it there and find what relevant entities are mentioned there. You can take note of that, and these are things you may wanna mention in your article. Uh, one more thing, or there's still a few things. <laughs> so also you can use Google Knowledge Graph to pull relevant entities. So for example, search for British royal family or whatever entity you're interested in finding relevant entities for. And then you, you can click on people also search for, and then you'll get a list of other relevant entities. Also, this I like this one so much, Google Knowledge Graph uh, Search API. Uh, you can use the demo. You don't need to... Um, uh, buy it or anything, and the, the you can paste paragraphs or paste just a sentence or whatever, and Google shows you what in that in that text that you pasted what it considers as uh, an entity. And then non-web resources, as the graph I created, I created just off the top of my head. You can brainstorm. You can just sit down. Okay, I'm writing a, 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 an article about how to bake fish in an oven. 
what is relevant what are relevant entities that make sense to be mentioned on that content okay we know what entities are we know why they're important uh, we know how to find them but how to include incorporate them in my workflow like i'm doing seo today um, what should i do to include entities first of all and i feel this is a really good strategy for you to uh do anytime like if you're anytime you're um executing uh, a content strategy or doing a content audit, it's a great way to start by creating a topical map. A topical map is basically like I created this on, on Google Sheets and I did it manually. Um, it's, it's just a map showing you like the topics and subtopics and how they are all structured on the website. And um, there are diff many ways you can do this. Uh, you can do it manually if the website is small. You can use tools like uh, Screaming Frog. Uh, and use the uh, tree graph. But then the only thing is that um, if the website is too big, your graph is going to look so messy in, in Screaming Frog, and you're probably not going to be able to use it. So I recommend that you only crawl like 200 or 300 pages at most, and then understand like what's going on in the website. Um, another thing you can do is actually go through the site map. And that, that's actually one of the very, very useful techniques. Like just go through the site map and understand how, where are topics and how they're structured. What topics you have and how they're structured, right? Um, yep. Next, so you have your graph. Uh, OK, let's say you want to optimize uh, Xeon National Park page. So you have the page, you know, you, you'll do your usual keyword research. You pull long tail keywords. Uh, you'll have some information about it. OK, what about the entities? Again, you'll do you use the tools that we mentioned above. Um, image search, uh, entity, Google Knowledge Graph, and so on. And you'll, for, for example, for this example and for simplicity, I just picked two entities, Hiking and Cable Mountain. But there are a lot of other entities that we can include as well. Um, so you end up with something like this. This is, again, is a very high level. Some people like to include, for example, a lot of other details for the keywords. But just as a high level, you'll have, OK, that's the topic. This is the main keyword. These are the long tail keywords. And these are the entities. Um, and if you notice that bottom of funnel pages usually represent one single entity. Uh, and bottom of funnel pages are usually like conversion pages, service, or, or um, or um, product pages, they usually represent one single entity, usually. Um, but what if you're working on something like how to uh, bake fish in an oven? This is not an article representing one entity. It's, it's, it's a guide for a process, and it does mention a few entities, right? So um, the reason I'm saying that is I don't want to give the impression that every single page necessarily have one main, main entity. OK, so um, yeah, once you have this sorted out, you have your uh, keywords, long tail entities, and you're optimizing. Um, opt uh, sorry, I'm just reading a question. We'll get into that, no worries. So um, once you have the, this information and you start optimize, you're done optimizing your page, the next thing is schema, right? And um, one cool thing you can do or great thing you can do is when you if your page has one main entity you can use web page schema and then add main entity data right and um look for like for example i'm talking about a park yeah there's a schema.org type specific type for park so main entity is park and then you add the information there and then you add same as and you mention the wikipedia page that refers to parks Right. You want to tell Google this entity is the same as that because Google uses Wikipedia uh, in, in its knowledge graph. Right. So that is the case if you have one main entity and you have a schema type for it. But what if you don't have a main entity or you don't have a specific schema type? Right. Like, for example, for tour, what if you want to tell Google that this page is also talking about an entity called tour? 
So uh, this is where you'll use the other um, schema code that I have on the slides. And I, I did put, put those codes here. So you are able to, you'll get the slides afterwards and you'll be able to like test that and you know experiment with it. So you can just create the type type thing and then give it a name, which is tour. And then it's same as, and then refer to a Wikipedia page, the, the, the relevant Wikipedia page representing that entity. So um, you have your, you updated the content, you added your schema. The last piece of the puzzle is the internal linking, right? Internal linking, there's nothing new here. It's it's same as usual. You'll you'll do your usual um, routine uh, for every main entity of your website. Every entity that means something, you'll you make sure that anytime it's mentioned on your website, it's linked back. You have an internal link to it, right? So, for example, for the Zion National Park, that's a page representing that that entity. Anytime on any page that zero national park is mentioned you'll link back to that page right so uh internal linking is so important and it gets more important when you're creating entities um i hope the 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 process is is no it's not i think okay olivia that's a really good question entities is not limited only to english language actually entities help google understand different languages so it understands for example the like um car in English is the same as uh, auto in, in, in German, for example. OK, this is like the funnest part for me, <laughs> uh, case study. And um, yeah, so this is a case study by Brian Cato, and I did add the link to it. It's, it's really, really good. What happened is that this is a small business, a local business, and it's offering some sort of service, and they wanted to do SEO for it. So what they do, did was really cool. They um, did entity SEO and I, using Google Maps, and they identified local entities, so geographical entities. So for example, if you're a, like a, a business, what, what are the main landmarks that are near you that are identified by Google as entities, right? And then they started to they took note of all of these uh, entities and then they started to incorporate them and sue them into the content. So, for example, um, XYZ Contractor, which is the client, is located in Old Town Fort Collins, which is an entity, and then just ahead of Horse Tooth, uh, that's another entity, and minutes from Colorado State University, another entity. So, it, they incorporated all those local entities in, into the content and the, it was amazing to see that this website, so the, to, to be very transparent, the work done was mainly technical and then entity SEO and, you know, the, the usual on-page optimization and entity SEO. Um, and the website received 32% lift by simply adding geographically relevant terms to the page and linking to driving directions, right? So they added driving directions from those nearby entities to the client location. And um, yeah, it, it's it's a really, really good case study because it's so simple, but it's so smart as well. OK, uh, I see someone asked how to rank entities on search. So first of all, what does that look like? Um, a good example is if, if you search for father of SEO, you'll have Bruce Clay is like is it shows up. So that's a, um, a way. That's what that's what we mean by ranking entities on search. Your entity appears for the the the, the relevant names it have, for example, right? Um, so how does that happen? It happens first of all relatedness. How related an entity is this to the search term? When you type "father of SEO," how how much is Bruce Clay or any other SEO is related to that, that term. How often is Bruce Clay mentioned in the context as the fa in, in, on other websites as the father of um, SEO, right? So that's relatedness. How 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 uh, like how much are you known for that? And then notability. So notability is uh, it was a it's it's um okay um what's the when you search for Apple on Google. Don't don't do that right now. Just guess. Are you gonna get um, Apple the company or Apple the fruit? You're gonna get okay. I'm 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 gonna break the silence here. You're gonna get Apple the company. Why? Why are you getting Apple the company, not Apple the fruit? Even though you know Apple the fruit is also an entity. Like because because of notability. So notability is 
Google is able to compare how important and how valuable an entity is in an industry compared to other industries. So what that means is that Apple as a fruit versus Apple as a company, which is more notable. And that's based off a lot of things like links, reviews, mentions, and relevance. So a lot of things. So even though they're not in the same industry, it's not like there are two companies called Apple and then Google needs to decide. No, they are two, two, two things, two entities called Apple in different industries. So Notability Google is able to compare them across industries and decide this is what the user is actually looking for. This is more likely what the user is looking for. And then the third thing is contribution. So contribution is in the same, so Notability is across industries or segments. No, contribution is in the same segment or industry. So for, for in the, if you assume that there are two companies called Apple, which one is going to re be returned or rank when someone searches for Apple? Or if there is two people called Ali de Solis, right? How many, who, who is going to be, um, who's going to show up when you um, search for that person? And, and um that that's 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 co so contribution and notability are a bit different because as i said no contribution is how much someone is known for a specific thing in a specific segment and then notability is across different industries totally uh last prizes so if you've been and one more thing about contribution is also how often you are referred to or how often you are um mentioned in in that in an industry as well Prizes is very clear from its name. Did you get any awards? Do you get any prizes, any notable or any remarkable uh, prize is definitely uh, would, would definitely help you rank. And this is why we always recommend to website owners and anyone who's trying to rank really, if you have uh, like any certifications, if you have any prizes, any awards, any thing of that sort, you definitely need to mention that on the website and, you know, you know add, like add the badge, link back, maybe give a brief, like write the name of the award or that sort of thing, right? All of these things are valuable. Okay, uh, I did mention tools, but this is like a super tool that I also added a link to, and I encourage you, hi I highly encourage you to uh, try it. So basically, what you do, this tool can take a bulk, like a, a a bigger chunk of text, and show you all the entities there. And this is useful because it helps you analyze your competitors' um, pages. So, for example, you can like whatever pages you're competing against, and you like, okay, I want to like pull all of the entities they have there or see what's relevant that I want to mention, that's a really good tool uh, to help you do that. And yep, I uh, added a list of resources. It's really hard to talk about entity SEO without mentioning Kurai and uh, holistic SEO. Uh, please make sure to check his website. He has tons of content there and I'm super happy to be here today. And yep, that's it for today. Uh, I think I can answer some questions. I can take one question actually. Um, cool. Thank you so much, Sarah. I think you've been monitoring the uh, the chat. Why don't you let's answer one more question before we take another we take a quiz? Yep. Uh, okay. So, so someone mentioned how they can take advantage of entity SEO to grow their business. So I, I think we did touch that briefly, or we did discuss that in in. Uh, the case study, you just need to find the identify your main entities or entity. Uh, maybe it's a service, maybe it's a specific product, or if you're offering a, a set of products, and then optimize their pages by including the relevant entities that should be there. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Do you see one more question that we could uh, answer? Maybe is the concept of entity SEO limited to the English language? Uh... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I did uh, touch on that. Yeah, Limit definitely, okay. it's not limited. It's not limited to that at all. It's it's actually that's the power. Uh, why how powerful knowledge graph is? It 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 does understand. It's a cross lingual uh, graph. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much. This was very very insightful. With that being said, I think we're gonna do a quiz. As somebody else has a chance to win one of those cool. Hoodies. What times of data SEO can be hard unless your tool can play as part. You've heard of SE ranking so hot right now. It makes the data simple, makes it wow. Get a bird's eye view of any market.
from a late to Kyoto, it's yours to target. With money keywords, we'll show you how to make you some suggestions that just wow. Oh wow! Long tails? What's next? Optimize your page and go rank up your text. Wham, bam, you're on track. Check up all your rankings, we got your back. In Google, YouTube, Yahoo, and Bing, while accurate rankings monitoring. To get to where you want to be right now, go tell your website issues show. She told her website issues show. Oh wow! To backlink on page two, everything you need to rule. Experts, users, all the while to come join our SEO crowd. Oh wow! All right, excellent. Why? Let's uh, launch the quiz here. So, again, somebody's gonna have a chance to win a hoodie. Uh, if you want to keep a page out of the search results, what is the best way of doing this? Uh, a, B, C, or D? All right, why don't give it a few seconds here. All right. Why don't we look at that? All right, a lot of people are answering. Uh, three, two more, two more seconds. One, two. All right, let's show the result. B. Yes, we have a lot of pros here. Excellent. So I think everybody got it right. Um, I think we have another question. All right, which of the following options is is not, isn't one of Google's algorithm updates. <laughs> A, B, C, D. Let's uh, give it about six seconds here. Panda, A, platypus, B, penguin, C, pirate, D. All right, let's do another three seconds. One two, three, all right, platypus, B would be the correct answer here. And I think we have one more question, right? All right, uh, in October of 2019, Google announced two new link attributes. What were they? A, no follow and no index, B, original and duplicate, C, UGC, user generated content and sponsored D high priority and low priority A, B, C or D. And then I think we'll announce the winner after the next presentation. So three more seconds here. One, two, three. And the answer is C, correct. Cool. So we get a lot of uh, correct answers here. I let the team on the back end um, uh, evaluate the winner. With that being said, I think we have five minutes to quickly do a chat about news and technical SEO. So that being said, I'd like to introduce everybody to my business partner, Daniel Burns. Hello, hello. Daniel, do you real briefly introduce yourself? Sure, sure. I use my experiences. I used to run a website design agency for about 20 years. So a lot of what I bring to the SEO world is how websites work hand in hand with the SEO strategy to make sure that we're getting the most out of the website. Cool. So I'm the sales guy here. I'm the CEO. I do, uh, as our uh, keynote speaker, Sean, I, I do all the sales calls. I do the selling, uh, initial proposal writing, right? And then I uh, we get the client and then it's like, wow, okay, net, now we have to deliver. So Daniel, as part of the our overall SEO strategy before we tackle micro SEO strategies, we take a look at technical issues with a website correct um let's talk we've got about three four or five minutes four minutes let's talk about how we do it here at bold seo marketing what do we do in terms of technical seo sure sure so um in terms of you know when we start a project there are 
dozens and dozens of things that we need to work on and and focus on. And it's important that we prioritize, right? And and prioritization means what are the things that we do in the beginning that are give that are going to give us the most you know bang for our buck. So. Technical fixes is usually one of them. And for two reasons. Number one, um, because anytime that we run a tech audit on the website, it's going to come out with, you know, some results. And usually those results are, you know, separated into like high important things that need to be fixed and then medium and then some other stuff. But usually those high ones we need to address usually right away in the beginning of the project for two reasons. Number one, because a lot of those could be affecting the usability of the site and the user experience of the site. So it's important to fix those. But secondly, a lot of these things that are getting picked up on the um, on the uh, tech audit are things that are actually hindering the performance of the website or actually hurting the ability for the website to rank better. Uh, and what I mean by that is a lot of times Google will look at a website and if there's technical issues with it, it actually gets penalized, right? A lot of these things that we pick up, we pick up from running uh, the SE ranking tech audit. We also look at Search Console, which comes up with some really, really good insights in terms of tech audits, uh, things in there. So the reason that we do it in the beginning, so when a project first comes in, the first thing we do is we run a tech audit and we look at the really important things that need to be addressed and we address them right away for two reasons. Number one, for the most part, anytime that we do a really good, clean tech audit on a website, we see an increase or a bump. Not all the time, but it, a lot of times we actually see that by just fixing the tech fixes, we already see you know, a, a, a bump in you know, the uh, improvement in organic uh, rankings. And second, we know for a fact that anything that we do afterwards, when we have a solid foundation of a website that's technically sound, everything that we do is going to get a little bit better traction, right? So, you know, focusing some time in the beginning to clear out the house and make sure that especially the high and, you know, the really important tech fixes are fixed, really important first step that we do internally. And then on the second note, another tech fix in a tech audit that we use a lot and we've been using a lot lately is the uh, SE ranking one page SEO checker. And what that does is I think Chris talked about micro strategies. And when you're specifically focusing on one page, what that does is it allows you to run a tech audit on one page based on one keyword, right? So what it does is in addition to all of the technical things that we need to make sure that are fixed on that site, it really gives us insights on how can we better optimize that page for a specific keyword not only with best practices, but then it also looks at competitors, sees what they're doing, what we should do. So that one page SEO checker, which I also include as part of our tech fixes is also a very powerful tool that we use on an ongoing basis as we're really focusing on specific micro strategy pages. Absolutely. So is a technical issues the biggest problem when it comes to SEO? I don't think so, but we need to address them, right? Uh, the, the recent Google algorithm updates are all about content, but we still have to address technical issues. We usually see a, I would say a five to 15% increase in organic search traffic after we address the most pressing technical issues. Yeah, and, and, and with that being said, it's, you know, every website is like a box of chocolates, right? You're gonna run a tech audit and you don't know what you're gonna find. And a lot of sites will run a tech audit and there's very little issues that we need to address. And some other ones have some really, really bad issues that yes, they're very important to fix. And when you fix them, you end up seeing a bigger bump on those that have, you know, kind of a longer list of issues that need to be addressed. So different cases, we'll see different results, but it's always very important to run an audit to understand what you're dealing with. Cool. Thank you so much, Daniel. Absolutely. Uh, I'll see you later. All righty. Thanks. Cool. All right. With that being said, I'm super excited to present uh, Sophie Gibson as our next presenter. And I think after uh, Sophie's presentation, we're going to announce the winner of the hoodie. So let's see if we can get Sophie here into the presentation. Hey, Sophie, how are you? Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, you're the technical SEO director. We just talked about tech SEO. Love to hear your uh, thoughts at Studio Hawk. You're going to talk about tracking 
measuring and improving core web vitals, a very important uh, algorithm signal. Uh, why don't you give us quickly introduce yourself a bit more and then let's dive right into your presentation. Perfect. Yeah, so um, that's right. I'm the technical SEO director. Um, so I'm kind of in charge of all things technical. Um, so making sure that the foundations are there, because um, as you guys were discussing earlier, um, if you've not got those foundations in place, then the rest is just so much harder to do. Um, so being able to make sure that, you know, Google can actually co co find your content and be able to, um, you know, prove that it's worthy of ranking for a search result. Um, you know, you can't do one without the other. You can have really great content, but if you can't find it, then you're kind of stuck. Um, but yeah, my one of my favorite things to talk about is Core Web Vitals and um, how that kind of those metrics, how we can use them and um, when we want to kind of start measuring Core Web Vitals and um, how we how we go about that and the tools that we can use to do that. Cool. All right, let's get into it. Perfect. So for um, what are we actually measuring with Core Web Vitals? So we're looking at three different things. We're looking at the loading time, um, interactivity of the content, and how stable the content is. So essentially, Google's trying to measure um, how, the, um, how the page experience is for people, because you know, it's trying to really make sure that people have a really great search experience. It's giving people relevant um, websites pages that are a delight to use, as well as very informative. Um, and some of the reasons why we might want to um, kind of start looking at Core Web Vitals as metrics, um, it's because studies have shown that better Core Web Vitals um, improves engagement and business metrics. So for example, 24% of people um, are less likely to abandon page load speed when it might meet those thresholds. Um, you can see an increase in conversions for every um, 100 milliseconds reduction in kind of largest contentful paint, so how long the content takes to paint there. Um, and you can also see an increase in page views per, um, per session, for every kind of 0.2 reduction in the content layout shift of a page. So let's dive into um, what those metrics actually are. Um, so looking at that, We've got long, largest contentful paint. So this is how long it takes kind of, sort of that main content to become visible. Um, how long does that take? Um, is it quick? Do people understand what the, that the page is loading? Um, so it will look a bit like this. So the largest contentful paint is that main piece of information that is on the page. So that hero image, how long does it take for that um, for initial bit of um, information to, um, to display for a user? And then you've got first input delay, which is how fast the page responds to initial interaction. So if you click a menu link, if you click um, a video link, how long does it take for that input to be recognized and for something to start happening? Um, so for example, using that sidebar, um, trying to access the other kind of bits of content, um, if it's still loading other elements of the page, you're not gonna get that feedback. Um, so it can only start processing once it's looked at all of the other bits of information that have loaded onto the site. And then you've got your content layout shift, which is looking at how stable the page is during that loading process. Um, so yeah, making sure that it's not moving around. So for example, uh, this is the gift that uh, Google gives an example. You're submitting an order. Um, you suddenly want to cancel an order, but an extra bit of information starts loading in and causes you to hit the wrong button. Um, obviously, that's really hard, um, a very bad user experience, especially if they're spending money. Um, but I think the biggest um, kind of issue that you see this happening is on news websites, where there are tons of um, advertisements that are moving in, pop-ups coming in, stuff moving the content on the main page, where you're clicking on stuff that you weren't initially intending to click on. So this is super frustrating for users. Um, and obviously, if you, people are going to have a bad experience or, you know, accidentally order something that they weren't intending to, then Google doesn't want to um, you know, promote those kinds of sites. So looking at how each of these metrics apply to the, um, the initial item. So loading time is essentially your largest contentful, contentful paint. Your interactivity metrics is the first input delay, so how long does it take 
to get that input in. And then you've got your visual stability, which is the CLS, your content layout shift. Um, so there are some benchmarks um, that Google gives in terms of what's good, what's um, under needs improvement, and what is classed as a poor experience. Um, and I think people always wonder, like, when when should you actually start really paying attention to um, to these metrics? Because um, not everyone really has the time or resources to be able to um, you know focus on these. When does it actually make sense for user business to actually run through um, through this and start looking at it? So I think mainly um, if your content is already solid, um, then then perhaps it might be start be looking at that. There's no point um, being having really great um, experience on the website if that content actually isn't matching a, a user's search intent, it's not comprehensive, it's not actually useful to, to the person, you know, obviously the helpful content update, making sure you've nailed that first um, is really important. Um, so if you know you've got a lot of work to do in terms of improving that content, then maybe it's not time to start looking at your, um, your web vitals. And I think um, making sure that it actually will put you ahead of the competition, because sometimes um, if you're comparing against other people's experience and um, kind of page experience metrics and actually they're so far ahead of you um, that you might, um, you know, then maybe you you need to have a look because actually other people are more likely to shop with them. Um, for example, if you're in retail um if they have a really great experience and then maybe you would need to focus on that, be able to match that. Um, so will doing that put you ahead of the competition? And I think if you're really struggling with ranking for competitive keywords, like you say, your content's top, Google can find the in, um, information, the technical is solid there, um, but perhaps you keep moving around quite often in the top three, for example, um, you're really struggling to kind of get that point of difference um, between you, your, um, your page and the other pages that are competing against you. And I think it's also worth looking at um, if traffic isn't a primary concern at the moment, because then if you've already got kind of quite a lot of um, people coming in through the door, um, then it's easier to try and focus on the kind of experience metrics. Whereas if you're struggling to get enough people actually onto the site, then probably not the best time to kind of focus on this because then again, you want to look, look at that content. What, um, how else can you attract people? What keywords are you not reaching at the moment? Um, so perhaps traffic isn't a primary concern if you're going to be looking at those core web vitals. Um, and it's also worth um, no, in that actually focusing and doing some um, work on these and um, if the conversion improvements are worth the time investment because there's a lot of work that goes into being able to improve um, core web vitals metrics and um, you know you might need external support such as developer time which can be expensive and um, or you know takes a lot of internal resource away from other, um, other projects and um, so if you're able to prove that those conversion improvements are really worth worth the time investment looking into COVID vitals, then definitely um, it might be time for you to start looking at these. Um, so uh, I don't know, in, at Brighton SEO, um, Grace did a really great talk about the SEO maturity audit. And I think if you're more on the mature end um, of your kind of SEO campaign and the work that you're doing, then COVID vitals is definitely worth um, looking into as the next step um, in kind of making sure that you're doing as much as you can to get really good um, results. So onto stuff like how do we measure um, some of these metrics? So what we need to do is we need to split the site into page templates. Um, so I'm gonna use e-commerce as an example a lot in these um, just for, cause that's usually like said, based on those conversions, um, it's likely more worth the, um, the time investment. Um, so, for example, for an e-commerce site, you'd look at the home page, product pages, category pages, perhaps some blog posts. If you're looking um, to, if you've got some kind of funnel content there, um, any kind of hub pages, perhaps any key landing pages that you're driving traffic to. Um, so anything, anything that's a big entry point for people um, and it has a specific um, design, um, then split it out into those templates. So what we need to do is grab the URLs. So for example, 
you might have something that looks like this, a product page, catalog page, home page, um, pull out a, an example URL um, for that. And then we need to look at getting the data. So we can do this manually. Um, tool that we really like to use for this is GT Metrics. Um, it has some really great benefits. So you can, if you register, you can save audits. Um, you can also compare against competitors. Again, really worth doing um, if you want to try and get ahead of those. And I found that the information it gives you really like clear core web vitals and metrics that's easy to see straight off of the bat. So when you run um, an audit here, it will look a bit like this. It will give you a, a grade um, from, from its own kind of preparatory way of um, understanding that information. But it will give you um, a kind of pull out of uh, the free web vitals metrics there for you. And it also gives you a nice um, film strip visualization to show you exactly when those key points are happening in that load process. So what we need to look at as well, another tool for doing this is using um, Lighthouse. Um, so we can run this via Chrome. So if you go to inspect or command shift I, depending on how, how you like to use it, um, and you head up to the arrow at the top um, on that pop out, then you can select Lighthouse from that menu. And I like to leave this all standard default, um, but you can analyze that, um, you can analyze that um, um, page. But you do need to watch out for browser extensions um, because these can affect um, how Chrome runs because sometimes it's inputting information um, and you'll need to try auditing the page in either incognito um, mode or um, from a Chrome profile that's a, you know, a blank one without any extensions. Um, so just to make sure that you're getting that accurate information. Um, but you can also do this at scale if you wanted to. Um, so most crawling tools have um, integrations with PageSpeed Insights to get that direct um, from that. So you can connect up and um, go into configuration and API access um, and find that PageSpeed Insights um, and connect it up. And the same for Sitebulb, um, you can use the performance and mobile friendly test um, to be able to um, use the, run those um, in crawls and find that information out for you. Um, and another tool, which I online, if you've not got a desktop crawler that you want to use, um, you can use um, a site like pagespeed.compare um, where you can actually use um, run multiple URLs at the same time. Um, so you can um, run an audit on those and then get those metrics. So once you've run um, kind of your audits um, and you've got the raw information, now we need to record those metrics. Um, so I like to add screenshots to a slide um, making sure you've got more information than you think you'd need because otherwise you will end up um, with contextless um, screenshots. Um, so I like to take full screen um, screenshots and then crop them out and add them to slides um, just to get those metrics in. Gives it a more visual um, visual uh, way of displaying information, especially when you need to present that information back to a client or a stakeholder, um, especially if they don't understand um, the, the metrics uh, themselves in general. So <laughs> for me, it would look something like this. Um, I've got um, a note of what the page is. So this is a product page, an example URL. I've got my screenshots of the key information, the key metrics, um, you know, the film strip that comes up with, um, and some of the kind of suggestions just to make sure I've got those recorded. Um, and then I also like to record this on a spreadsheet for better analysis. So for example, you would have your different page groups, you would have your example URLs, and you would benchmark those um, Core Web Vitals metrics. But you do need to watch out for, uh, there is a missing um, first input delay metric. Because if you have a look on the Lighthouse course, it doesn't show um, that as a, a, a metric. Um, and whilst GC metrics does give you um, LCP and CLS, um, the third metrics I says is um, one of them is TBT. Um, and you're like, what might that be? Um, and this is because um, first input delay actually requires a real user um, and it can't be measured in lab data. So how we're doing, we're running simulated tests at the moment. So we're 
simulating how um, the page would load. Um, and because Google doesn't click, it can't measure it um, in a fake way. You're going to have to make sure that those details are gathered um, using the live data from your website. Because um, yeah, you've got the simulated performance me metrics, but thankfully, total blocking time metric is lab measurable and it correlates well with that first input delay metric. Um, so that's really good that we can actually substitute that in. Um, so we're now able to find the first input delay or actually it's the total blocking time benchmark for that that we're using as a proxy. Um, you can find the actual um, first input delay metrics uh, under in Google Search Console um, under the experience and core web vitals section. Um, and it will kind of tell you which pages are having a first input delay um, issue and will mention on aggregate the page groups, how long those are taking, which you can use instead. Now, another thing that I really like to record metrics of is those competitors, um, because like I say, you need to see how far away from those competitors are and, you know, are they doing a much better job and you really need to work on those kind of Cobweb Vitals metrics. So again, we'd run the exact same process, but with those competitor pages. So similar to what you've already pulled for your key landing pages, um, page groups, you would pull a competitor URLs for those. Because comparing adds that extra context so you can show here there's these are two competitors that I'm trying to beat, for example, and um, here are their scores. This is how well they're doing. We can say, um, for example, uh, the on the left, we've got monkey. Let's say that's us. I can say, hey, um, next are actually doing far um, better. Um, they have actually a really great first contentful paint and the page doesn't shift around at all. Um, you know, that's got a good score, whereas we really need to actually and improve that to be able to actually put in ourselves in a better place to be able to compete with um, the site experience. Like I said, if, especially if you're really com competing quite hard and you're moving around quite a lot within the, the top um, kind of search results. And thankfully, again, this is where um, the page speed compare tool comes in really handy because you can use it for multiple, um, multiple URLs to actually look at those. Um, so you can pop in all of your competitors in at the same time. Um, so you can have a, a whole information running for all the competitors at the same time. So you don't have to, um, you know, keep going back and doing the lighthouse tests on each one. Um, and it's easier to compare. And it's also useful because it gives you a really nice film strip. Um, so you can actually visualize that loading process. Um, because it's much easier to explain to a client. You can say, um, look, when we're at the bottom, when this page is loading, it actually takes up until um, way, way past the main content it's taken to load on the Zara website. So we actually really need to um, make sure that people can understand that the page is loaded and that the information is there as soon as, as soon as it is, just to improve that experience. So again, you would put in, put in all your benchmarks for those competitors just to be able to, again, compare, make sure that those key pages um, are, you know, you've recorded how they're doing and how close you are to beating them and what's your nearest competitor. Um, and now we'll need to um, dig into the opportunities. So this is looking at actually what information do we have um, and what suggestions do these tools that we're using to kind of get these metrics? Um, what suggestions do they have as to what might be responsible for these slow loading speeds? Um, so usually it will give you um, quite a few technical bits of information. So for chaining critical requests, main thread tasks, stuff like this. Um, and the same in terms of Lighthouse, um, it will very um, handily give you um, time savings of estimated how much time each specific opportunity might be able to save. Um, but again, this can be quite com confusing um, when you're looking at it um, because they're not really written in plain text. Um, so you could be looking at this and thinking critical requests, main thread tasks, network payloads. Um, how am I meant to like understand what's, what's required um, in order to be able to put my suggestions forward? But actually, this does just drill down to um, three main questions that you need to ask yourself 
um, when you're looking at these and um, kind of just use the um, opportunities as a bit of guidance of where to look and instead using these questions um, in order to understand what changes you might need to suggest. So for example, how many resources are loading? What types of resources on the site are large in size? What's taking a long time because they're too big? Um, and what other things are stopping the page from loading? Um, so in GT Metrics, this tells you, um, give you page details with a bit of breakdown of those kind of file sizes and page requests. Um, so for this one, we can see that actually the, um, the largest chunk of um, information on the site that it's trying to download is JavaScript. Um, and there's a lot of image requests on here as well. Um, so what can we be able to do um, in order to kind of affect those? Because those are the biggest factors. Um, I also really like to use um, web page test to have a look to get some extra information. Um, so you can, again, run an audit of this and you can start your test and it will give you um, some metrics. Um, it will, again, give you those um, Core Web Vitals um, metrics in that. Um, and it will also give you the real user measurements. So Chrome um, automatically pulls um, some real user information, which is where you get your first input delay metrics from. Um, so it will be able to pull that information in. Um, but what's really useful um, in this tool is it gives you a list of all the different resources when they load in the page. And it will show you what is blocking the rendering happening. So these are the main things which are, we're actually waiting for um, in order for the rest of the page to load. And they're blocking anything else from happening. So we're unable to start the loading process um, for anything else that we're looking at downloading. Um, so why is this an issue? Um, this is because when um, when the browser is processing the information on the page, um, it's going to be being, begin passing that HTML. It's going to be reading through all of the information. Um, and then actually, it needs a script to be able to figure out um, there's some dynamic content on there. So it's going to have to stop, wait, download, um, download that script, um, and then execute it before it can continue doing anything else with the page, pulling out all the content. And every time there's something that it comes across that it's again got to re-download, it stops that process. So that's what takes um, so long for that initial first paint of that, all of that content to load for you. Um, but what we can find is that potentially there's some scripts that are stopping page load but are not actually essential um, to that. So is there anything that we can look at from there and either remove it? Um, because at the moment, um, the head is usually the biggest single render blocking part of a page. So all of the code that is within the um, head of the, the site, um, that's going to be causing the biggest issue. So he's done some really great um, videos on this, on about how to optimize um, your head in order to um, have a better um, better processing of that content information to stop that render blocking happening. Um, it's because usually um, you will go into a website and you will find script after script after script. Um, so it might look a bit like this. Um, this is all script types. I've zoomed in. Um, and this is the, the first, um, I think, 30 or so lines. This is all scripts, um, tracking scripts, because everyone, all of the marketing departments want to track all of the things all at once. Um, but we need to ask ourselves, do we really need to track it? Can we remove something? So remove the removable. So again, asking yourselves those three questions. Is it essential to the page load? Does it actually need to be on this page? And do we need to track this right now? Um, so we need to find the culprit of these. So let's have a look. So some big culprits I always find are the um, kind of big hitters, stuff like chatbots, um, heat mapping and um, tracking that people have got on, um, stuff like Google Maps, um, where you might find that actually you don't have Google Maps on your product pages, they're only on the location pages. Um, but actually the codes across all the site, is it actually essential for that page load? And stuff like social media feeds. Um, I know some people really want um, you know, a widget in the in the footer of a website, which has a live feed of their um, Facebook updates. Um, 
but is that really required for every single page? Um, are people going to your site to read your um, Facebook updates at the bottom of that? Perhaps not. Um, and stuff like heat maps is if you're tracking stuff that you weren't um, planning on tracking, um, you know, you've done your experiment, you've got enough data, but actually nobody takes that code off the website. There's no point uh, kind of keeping storing this, lots of information if you're not actually going to act on it. So can you, is there any old, um, old tests that you've done, old tracking that you can take away? And then once we've looked at what we can actually kind of remove the, from the equation, can we just take some scripts out? We need to delay the deletable. So what can we put off loading until later in the process? That's not essential for that page load. So we don't get stopped at that rendering point. So for this, we can add a defer attribute to, um, to our scripts. So that's just adding that. That will pop that to the script to the end of the queue. Um, and stuff for like images, if you've got a lot of images on the website, you can lazy load anything that is not essential, it's not that piece of first initial content. Um, you can anything below the fold, you can put that off till later because it's not essential for that first immediate page load. And then once you've looked at that, we need to restructure the restructurable. So there is um, a way of structuring um, the code on the website. Um, in order to have a bit of an optimal way of um, processing it. Um, again, Harry Roberts pulled this all out. Um, I've added a slight tweak to it because at number three, I've put the page title and meta description um, before all of the scripts, because that is key page information. Google can um, miss a lot of info um, if it's not there. Um, but if you could just restructure the other scripts that are left once you've deferred and removed what you can, um, then we'll hopefully be able to speed up just from um, actually understanding how Google is loading the page. Uh, once we've done that, we can look at compression. So we can see that there's a lot of images on the site um, and we can use uh, the Cloudinary tool um, to be able to analyze, actually, do we need our images at the size that they're at? So we pop in our page and it will tell us um, what compressions we could do. Maybe we might need a different file size. Um, we could say, actually, we could reduce uh, the size of this um, full page banner because um, at the moment it's only loading in um, at 1500 pixels and we've got it at 1900. Can we just resize it so it's not, there's not as of information to transfer? So we can use Squoosh um, and that, that will, um, you can essentially drop in your image and you can view and the before and after so you can compress it and resize it and make sure that it's actually kind of reducing in size so for this one you can see like about 78 percent reduction in size again just make sure that there's um, as little information that you need to transfer um, to the browser when it's actually loading the stuff and then you've got your stuff um, in relation to your um, visual stability so the cls um, so stuff that really affects this is Images without dimensions, um, ads, video, iframes, that kind of thing, and any dynamic indexed content that moves stuff around. Um, because if you um, specify the size of the image that is loading in, then the, that space will get reserved. Um, so for when that image does finally load in, that is not moving any of the additional content on the page. Um, it never used to be um, something that you'd really have to look at because um, when you had um, a website which were resized to um, to whatever size people were looking at on mobile, for example, um, they take all, all that away. Um, but unfortunately, it messes with the stability. So it is important again. So I definitely recommend reading this article by Barry Pollard. And then also Chris Johnson does a layout shift generator to find out exactly where those problems are. Um, so for example, uh, you pop in your URL, and it will spit out um, a GIF and show you exactly what the um, the biggest culprits of this is. And you can use the inspect tool to find um, the name of the element which is causing the issue for you. And then this makes sure that you're able to pull that information out, describe what is actually happening and what um, why why the, the page is moving around. You can just write that in plain text. Um, and another tool which is really good for um, measurement is Speetles. Um, so you can actually um, kind of measure your performance and keep a tab and making sure that actually everything um, is running as smoothly as you want. 
um, just to make sure that you've got it covered and you don't actually have to um, you know, keep on manually checking. Because it's really important to test um, your changes because you can use Google Lighthouse to be able to estimate the impact of your changes. So under the network tab, um, if you, you can filter down to have different file sites. So looking at those opportunities that the um, tools have given you earlier, um, and we've said, hey, actually, we don't need um, a particular script because you know it's a tracking script, it's a chatbot. Um, if you right click, you can select a block request URL. And then what this will do, um, it will you can then rerun um, a Lighthouse audit um, and it will simulate it with those um, scripts turned off. So go back to your report and then it shows you the actual time saving that you have done there. Um, so yeah, so you can see that speed index, you can see the before and after results. Um, so you can actually say the changes that we were proposing, they're, they're going to have this impact because it's easier to understand this. Because again, looking at that 1.3% increase in conversions, um, increase in conversions for every, like looking, so Google used to have a really good impact calculator um, to work this out for you. Unfortunately, they've, they've recently ta taken it off. Um, it was the Think with Google um, tool, but we can use the same principle um, to be able to see what the improvements might, um, might cost financially. So for example, if we're looking at a site, let's say they've got, we've got the visitors per month, um, we've got a current organic conversion rate, and we've got our average um, order value for the organic traffic. And we're looking at increasing by a second. And um, we've said, look, the contentful paint, that's going to take a second off. Um, you know, let's add that up. So we've got a one point, um, you've got 10 times 1.3% increase. So what this would look like to you is your new conversion rate, you'd get potentially 11 extra orders from this, which is worth an, an extra, you know, nearly a thousand pounds in additional revenue um, for doing this work. So it's really great for getting buy-in and again, proving that you, the value of the work that you're suggesting and actually saying this is going to financially benefit the site. Again, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, it's worth doing if conversions um, is focusing on conversions is really going to benefit you fin financially. It's worth the time investment. Um, but yeah, you just got to make sure that you really um, kind of making suggestions that move the needle um, and that are actually going to impact the bottom line. Um, yeah, I think that's so that's everything from me, um, because, yeah, just making sure that you've done everything you've done you can prove the value of that and then making sure that those those um everything that you're suggesting that you want to implement is it going to affect that bottom line is it worth doing that improvement um just so you can actually get buy-in to put that dev development resource in wow awesome <laughs> thank you so much uh, sophie technical seo is a beast i'm going to be honest it's my least favorite part of SEO but it's so important it ma it makes a difference we see it with our clients right it, it just increases the baseline that we can you know have then to work with um gosh with that being said let me see I think you answered everything that um you promised to answer in your presentation Kudos from our attendees. Sophie, thank you so much for this presentation. Again, the recording will be available. A lot of people ask for the recording. That being said, I quickly want to announce the winner randomly selected. We had a lot of people with the right answers for a quiz before. Uh, and I hope I'm going to say the name right. Meta Dixit. Uh, Meta Dixit. You're uh, the, the lucky winner of this beautiful hoodie there. So congratulations. With that being said, uh, our next presentation is upon us. We're going to continue the track of technical SEO. Uh, I'm super excited to welcome Omi Sido. I hope I said your name correct. The Senior Technical SEO at Canon Europe. Hey, 
Hey, Omi, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, 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 definitely. Can you hear me? Next. Yeah, where are you located? Uh, Axbridge, London. Oh, cool. Very <laughs> I'm good. still at work, basically. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, I haven't <laughs> finished, you know. Excellent. If you want to move a little bit closer to your mic, uh, I can, uh, if that's can possible, maybe. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Omi, you're going to talk about data driven technical SEO research. We're going to continue the track of technical SEO. Mm -hmm. Again, quickly introduce yourself and then let's get right into it. Uh, I think we're a few minutes behind schedule, but uh, no okay. rush. Okay. Okay, so, okay, my name is uh, Omi Sido. Uh, I'm the senior technical SEO at Canon Europe. I work for Canon Europe. I've been doing SEO and digital marketing for around six or seven years. And before that, I used to work as a front-end developer. <laughs> I was uh, building Flash websites. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Okay, okay. Yeah, I used to build <laughs> Flash websites that uh, obviously don't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All uh, right. Let's get into it. Uh, okay, okay. So, shall I start it? Okay, okay. Perfect. So, okay, again, I'm going to repeat. My name is Omi Sido, and I'd like to say a uh, massive uh, thank you to SEA Ranking for having me here. As you just heard, I'm still at work. <laughs> yeah, Christmas is coming, and we are very busy. For those of you who don't know me, I love talking about uh, digital marketing and SEO. And uh, for those of you who never heard of me or never seen me, I'm very <laughs> active on social media. So uh, don't follow me if you don't want to be spammed with a lot of messages. But yes, okay, I know we are a little bit out of time. So enough about me. Let's talk about uh, technical SEO as technical SEO is one of the two main parts of uh, search engine optimization. I'm going to start with a very simple uh, question. What is technical SEO? Technical SEO is the process of ensuring that a website, your website, by the way, meets the technical requirements of modern search engines. Most of the time, of course, uh, we, or at least me, myself, I'm talking about uh, Google. I'm based in Europe, so Google is the most popular engine. But if you're based in America, probably you also want to please uh, Bing. Now, like every, like every company in the world, Google wants to please its customers. And by pleasing its customers basically means to give them the best possible product. When it comes to Google, the best possible product is the search engine result pages, the search. To do that, they have to evaluate our web pages and rank them using their algorithms. By, by improving the technical health of your website, you help Google to grow and understand well your web pages. In return, Google may, may award you with better rankings. What I'm trying to tell you here is that many people say, uh, don't optimize for the search engines, optimize for the, for the users. But what I'm trying to say, tell you that they're not just your users, they're also Google users. So you have to please actually Google first and then Google pleases its users, and in return, Google may award you with a better rankings. I hope it's not too complicated. <laughs> I know it's a bit late. So vice versa. If you make any uh, serious technical um, uh, mistakes on your website, your rankings will drop. I can promise you that. There are so many examples I can give you, like uh, blocking a category from crawling in the robots.txt uh, file, to canonicalize, uh, oh my God, I'm, I, 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 I'm trying to talk, uh, to speak too quickly. To canonicalize, uh, to canonicalizing, uh, canonical, uh, the old domain to the new domain during a website migration. So yes, I don't know what's happened with me in this uh, word uh, canonicalization. Uh, so yes, a technical SEO is um, very important 
But don't forget that in order to hit number one in the Serbs, you also have to optimize your content SEO. In a way, you have to uh, uh, be the best at technical and, and SEO content at the same time, meaning your website health and your content have to be good in order for you to uh, uh, rank number one. With that in mind, many customers, many customers, many even digital marketers asking me, Omi, what is a better, uh, technical SEO or content SEO? And uh, to, answer the, to answer this question, I will say something that I've already said many times online, but I'll repeat myself until people understand it. Technical and content SEO, from my personal experience, are equally important. Very, very, very rarely we see pages, websites ranking well in the serves that have bad technical SEO and good content SEO and vice versa. Many, very, very rarely we see uh, websites uh, ranking well in the serves who have good uh, 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 content SEO and bad technical SEO. Uh, with that in mind, recently, uh, SEA ranking uh, conducted um, a technical audit of around 41,000 uh, 41, websites and built a list uh, and build a list of the most common SEO issues people have on their websites, right? Uh, now, SEA ranking will publish an article giving you all the issues because the list is quite long, to be honest with you. Uh, the, the list is quite long, you know? Uh, so they will publish a, an article giving you all the issues uh, they found and all the details. So today I just wanna, uh, just wanna discuss uh, some of the issues and give you my personal opinion and experience. But before going into the specifics, I'd like to make something uh, very uh, clear. Uh, no single technical SEO element is more important than the rest. When I say technical, when I say technical SEO, I mean the important technical SEO elements. Right? We're not talking about uh, H6 uh, or something like that. Right? We're talking about the things that really matter. So no single technical ele uh, SEO element is more important than the rest. They all work together common a, uh, towards a common goal, which is basically uh, better rankings. Or to say it in a different way, if tomorrow you start working on a new website, and you fix all H1s, you may not see any boost in your rankings simply because your canonicals are messed up or internal linking is messed up or your page speed is slow. You know, Sophie was just talking about the page speed, right? So yeah, you may fix one element, but if the rest is not up to standard, if the rest is not good, you will still not see any boost in uh, rankings. As an SEO, you have to work on all technical elements, all important SEO technical elements, and you have to try and improve everything. Look at the big picture, don't look at the small picture. So earlier I told you that content and technical SEO always work together, do not, do not separate. Okay, you can always call yourself a technical SEO, content SEO, but you should not separate them. They always work together, and now I'm telling you, no single technical SEO element is more important than the other. You know, even one of them is, even if one of them is messed up in whatever way, you will, uh, you will uh, suffer. So with that in mind, let's start with the missing old text. In 2018, Ran Fishkin conducted research into where the search happens on the web and discovered that a massive portion of people uses Google image uh, search. Now, I know I'm talking about 2018, but believe me, the numbers nowadays are very, very similar, right? So, and also depending on your niche, this, uh, this number, the one that you see on the screen can be higher or lower, right? Depending on your niche, right? 
But in all cases, not having the old text for me is a missed SEO opportunity to bring more people to your website. Also, the better Google understands your images, the better it will understand your content and vice versa. Obviously now, remember what I said earlier, obviously now to rank good, to rank well in the image, uh, Google image search, right? The old text alone is not enough. Google also looks at your image sitemap, structured data, the content surrounding the images, and even the image file name. Again, uh, different SEO elements are working together towards the, the a common goal, which is uh, better rankings. The next one is missing meta description. Now, I know some people say, don't worry about them as they're not a ranking factor. And to those people, I wanna say, yes, true. They are not a ranking factor. I accept that, you know. But the meta description is one of the first thing that searchers see when they encounter one of your pages. And also, they help with click-through rate, which is an important metric, right? It's an important metric for, for us. As an SEO, we know that this is an important metric. So the meta description is impacting this metric so the missing meta description is a missed SEO opportunity. Uh, optimizing meta description, sorry, the button here is so low to, ch to change the slides, <laughs> or maybe I don't know how to operate with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, uh, this um, software. So optimizing meta descriptions is not that difficult, right? If you follow these steps, it's an easy process the main thing you have to remember is think about relevance, relevance, relevance. Also, in order to increase your click-through rate and in general to improve your sales and stuff like that, what I always uh, advise people is to add a clear call to action. A clear call to action, not just in the meta descriptions. Also, why not in the page title? Uh, last but not least, don't keyword stuff, you know, <laughs> I underlined it here, right? <laughs> so so it, it, it's quite, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, obvious. Now, saying that, a lot of people are asking me, a lot of clients basically are asking me, uh, SEOs know that, at least most SEOs know that, does Google rewrite meta descriptions and page titles and the short answer, and unfortunately the answer is yes. Uh, some people uh, say that this happens uh, something uh, like 70% uh, of the time. But from my personal experience, this uh, number, this figure is a little bit uh, hit and miss. Now, Google normally rewrites meta descriptions and page titles because they don't align with the search intent. I, I hope I said it as uh, I, I try to say it as, as low as possible. They don't align with they don't align with the search in, uh, intent. Also, if Google rewrites your metadata, but you think you think it's good, it means that Google doesn't understand the page the way you intended it, right? So obviously, if you don't have it, if you don't have the meta description and the page site all together, Google will give you one. And from my personal experience, or for at least for the clients that uh, uh, I've worked, uh, I've worked for, the 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 way the algorithm writes this page title, this meta description is not always very good, to be honest with you. But my advice would be to experiment with your meta description and meta title at the same time, so you can truly understand why Google thinks that your metadata does not relate well with the content on your page, right? So here, if you look at the, the, the slide that I'm presenting, you can see that Google didn't like my meta description. Although in my personal opinion, I think uh, at the bottom, you can see my original meta description. Although I think that my meta description is actually quite good, right? But Google decided to 
the, the, the algorithm decides that my beta description is not good. Google, the, the search query link GA4 to BigQuery, Google found, found this uh, H2, which is basically saying exactly the same, Google Analytics for to BigQuery, right? And underneath, you can see the, 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 the answer. So what Google is trying to do for this particular search query is give the answer directly into in the SERPs. So somebody wants to know how to link J4 to BigQuery and Google is like, let me give you the number. Now take it uh, the ways you want to take it. I think that my meta description is better, but if the algorithm thinks that their the, the algorithmically rewritten uh, meta description is better than mine, there you go. I probably have to, adjust next time. Also, on the left side, on the side, uh, maybe on, uh, on your side is the right, you can see an article that Google, uh, Google um, published uh, last year around uh, August, around August, you know, and they do, yes, they, admit, they admitted that they do rewrite the page titles, meta descriptions, and they may use some elements from the page. Meaning, again, my previous comment, all Technical SEO elements are working together towards the common SEO goal, which is better rankings. The next one, H1. So uh, look at the newspaper picture. What's the first thing that, you, that you've noticed? Obviously, the page title, right? All your pages should have an H1 tag to draw the visitor's attention and, and give a clear indication on the content uh, of the content on the page. From my personal experience, having great H1 tags, especially when they uh, when you match them to your title tags, can make a big def difference uh, to your SEO performance. Uh, again, uh, if you look at the picture uh, at the bottom. Uh, Google, in this case, uh, decided to replace the original uh, page title, which was the, the, sa the, same page, the same page title without the number 12, you know. Google decided again to rewrite the page title using the H1. So if your, H1, if your page title is not, uh, is not good and your H1, does, I'm just uh, speculating here, obviously here. I, I'm not saying that if your page title is not good, Google will, will automatically take the H1. But logically, it makes sense to go to the first uh, uh, element on the page, which is normally the H1. So if your page title is not good, Google will jump onto a your H1. And if your H1 is not good, then you're in trouble. You're going to see something very bad displayed in the serves. Also, notice, uh, again, I was speculating about the H1 here, why Google used the H1. Basically, if you look at the serves for this, Term, outdated SEO tactics, you will notice that all the results have a number in the page title. Google looked at this page, so that the page title doesn't have the number, the page title is just obsolete SEO tactics to avoid in 2022, so that the H1 actually has the number 12 and replace the page title. Funny enough. Also, notice, I, it's not, uh, I didn't uh, bold it here, but no, notice that the meta description, the meta description is a, a combination of the H1, which is 12 obsolete SEO tactics to avoid in 2022. And then there is a list of the actual tactics, meaning good, to create this uh, meta description. I actually don't remember what was the original meta description or whether there was a meta description there. You know, the, the, to create this meta description, Google, again, is trying to answer the question directly into the serves. Take it however you want, but this is a good indication that for this particular uh, 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 search term, you have to have a number in the page title. You have to have a page title first. You have to have a number in the page title. And then you have to have a list in your article. You know, again, all technical SEO element working, to get, working together towards the common goal, which is better rankings. And also, again, you have to optimize everything, not just one. Do not promise your customers that you're going to optimize the H1 and you're going to automatically have better rankings. It may happen if everything else is perfect, right? You may, you may, you may, you may tell them, I'm going to fix your uh, canonicals and everything's going to be perfect right away. 
you know, but only if everything else is uh, okay. The next one, uh, no inbound links and uh, orphan pages. Now, we can have a whole conference talking about orphan pages only, uh, and um, this problem is almost unavoidable. Almost unavoidable, to be, I'm gonna be honest with you. As our websites grow in a volume, some pages or whole sections of the websites are left behind. Behind. Without going into details, I don't. I know that we don't have much time. Without going into details, often pages are bad for SEO because if you have a lot of them and you've got a big website, they may hurt your crow budget. I've seen it with my own eyes. They're also bad for the user experience if, um, as if they're found in the in the SERPs they may have outdated content. Basically, almost, from my personal experience, most of the time, if there's a, a orphan page, the content is outdated because like people say, uh, what, did they, what do they actually say? Out of mind, uh, out of sight, out of mind, right? Almost 90% of the time, the page is, uh, the content is outdated, but the page still ranks in the serves. On the other side, if a page with good content became an orphan, right? After some time, Google may decide to de-index this page which obviously results in uh, a loss of uh, traffic. And, uh, Andrew uh, Zerudny, I hope I'm pronouncing this name, uh, sorry, Andrew. Andrew Zerudny from SE Ranking, you know the guy, he's quite popular, has a very good article about orphan pages. He explains very clearly how to find them. And I would strongly recommend you read it, you read this article, so you can learn more about this unique and not talked enough, not talked enough as your problem. For now, I just want to say that fixing, uh, fixing uh, orphan pages, finding and fixing orphan pages is not that difficult, you know, and uh, it sh this should be your number one priority if you're in charge of a big website. If you're in charge of a small website, small website up to, I'll say 10,000 pages, don't bother too much. But if you're in charge of a big website, please, this should be your number one, one priority. Priority. Also, <clears throat> oh my God, I'm uh, stuttering a little bit. Also, I, I really wanna mention here, David Lewis, uh, this uh, uh, from uh, Trainline, Trainline, this is a very popular company, company in Europe, uh, who literally deleted Three, uh, no, three, <laughs> I wish it was three. It was 130 million pages, I'm not joking. 130 million pages, many of them, many of them, often pages in order to fix uh, the SEO of uh, his uh, website. Uh, please watch this video, it's very interesting. You're gonna learn a lot about uh, technical SEO in general, and this is a Brighton SEO talk by uh, David Lewis. I did, uh, uh, now I remember, I did something very, very similar four or five years ago. Uh, what was the name of the website? I don't remember something, tutor, no, tutor fair, tutor, tutor fair. You know, I did something very similar where I reduced, uh, this is four or five years ago, I reduced a half a million, almost half a million uh, page, uh, uh, half a million pages uh, uh, website to around 80,000, 80,000, from, from half a million to 80,000. And I deleted, I remember this number, 150,000 orphan pages. Now, some websites don't even have 150,000 pages, right? I deleted, <laughs> it just happened. As I said earlier, as our websites grow, we tend to forget pages and whole sections of the website just, they're still there on the server, but we don't link to them, yeah? So I deleted almost 150,000 pages. Uh, 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 to be fair, I also fixed uh, some H1s, uh, uh, canonicals, uh, stuff like that. It was not just the orphan pages, but after reducing the website size, 150, minus 150,000 uh, orphan pages, the result was almost 40% more traffic within the next six months. Not bad, not bad. So now the next one, uh, too many uh, 301 redirects. Now, because, before going any further, I, I would like to say that in itself, in itself, the 301 redirect is not a problem. 
you are allowed to have as many uh, tier one redirects as you want. But too many redirects, too many redirects from my personal experience lead to long redirects chains, right? And they start creeping into your sitemaps. You know, you know we're not allowed to do that, right? I mean, you know we're not, it's not good to have tier one redirects in your sitemaps, but they will start creeping there, you know? And yes, sooner or later, sooner or later, if you have too many uh, 301 redirects, you end up with a lot of redirect loops. Sooner or later, you, you will end up with, as the website grows, the orphan pages grows and everything else grows, your, your redirects loop will, loops will also grow. And we know, and we know that this is not good for the Google bot. And we know that this is not good for the user experience. Fixing them is not that bad. And to be honest with you, from my personal experience, maybe you have different experience than me, but from my personal experience, every time I start working on a new website for a client, on a new project, and I see countless number, a countless number of 301 redirects, the only thing that comes to my mind is that the previous agency, the previous SEO, whoever was in charge of SEO before me, didn't have a well-executed, uh, I'll say clear first, clear and well-executed SEO strategy. And, you know, as I told you earlier, SEO is one of the two main uh, streams of SEO. I'll call it a stream, right? And it's a very important thing. We have to build everything from ground up, you know? Without technical SEO, you almost always fail, to be honest with you, you know? From my personal experience, especially if you've got a big website. So yeah, when I see a countless number of 301 redirects left over, you know, my first uh, instinct is like, okay, whoever was here before me didn't have a clear and well-executed SEO uh, strategy. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, if a page or a section of, <laughs> of your website, if a page doesn't have organic visits, no organic visits, no uh, organic visits, doesn't have any uh, backlinks, right? It's not linked from anywhere, right? We're talking about the orphan page. Doesn't have any backlinks, doesn't have, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, have any organic visits, Maybe it's time to go. Maybe a 301 redirect is not the best thing, just 404 this page. Maybe it's time to go. Also, looking at the time, maybe it's time for me to go and end this uh, conversation, the presentation and conversation. I hope this will turn into a conversation. As I told you earlier, I'm very active on social media. You can always ask me any questions. Uh, and thank you very much for coming to my talk. Hi, Chris. I hope I was quick enough. <laughs> I can't hear you, Chris. Sorry. Uh, hi, Chris. I can't hear you. So I muted myself. Uh, yeah, I can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Omi. Yeah, I mean, technical SEO, it's such a beast, right? It is... Uh, it is massive, yes. It is a necessary evil. Again, it's not my favorite SEO topic or task to tackle. But I mean, you did an amazing job really uh, sharing insights that need to be addressed. Um, I think, let me see. Are there any questions? Otherwise, you can always find me on Twitter. I'm very active. On yeah, Twitter I think we're gonna, or LinkedIn. we're gonna forward questions directly to you. I think we're nearly 20 minutes behind schedule. Okay. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you very good much for having me here, uh, guys. And uh, have a good evening. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Barry. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me here. Woo, good. How are you? I got my uh, swag.
<laughs> SC ranking. Excellent, excellent. All right, so now we're a little bit over time. So much is happening in search right now. So many uh, algorithm updates. Uh, definitely want to make the most of this presentation. Barry, uh, you're a contributing editor to Search Engine Journal. I get my news from you first. Uh, Search Engine Land. Search, Search Engine, Engine Land. 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 Search Engine. Yeah. Search. Um, why don't you briefly introduce yourself if people don't already know you? Yeah, I'm one of the more well-known content spammers in the SEO space. I, that's a joke. I write a lot of content about SEO topics. I've been writing about um, search engine topics, Google, you name it. Um, cert, more, mostly on the organic side, but also on the paid side. For almost 19 years. Next week will be my 19th year anniversary of writing about search. Um, I look older than I am, um, but I've been yeah, so I, I know a lot about um, the history of Google, what direction they're going, how they've been going there. I recently interviewed the head of the VP of Google Search, who's in charge of all core rankings, HJ. Um, and I have a lot of historical knowledge and history and insight into where Google's going um, in terms of that. I also have a web development company based in New York. Um, and, um, you know, you guys are a great company and I'm happy to be a part of this event. Cool. So one of my questions, how do you get the news? Well, it seems like you have an army of people that, you know, they see something on Google and they, they, they send you the information and then you write about it and it gets to millions of people. How do I get the news? Um, so there's multiple ways. Some people in the SEO search community actually ping me on social media, Twitter. I'm very, very active on Twitter. At My handle is at Rusty Brick. So if you see something, definitely let me know. Most of the time I find stuff by searching and, scr and scrounging around through the SEO forums, uh, search community forums, both on old fashioned forums like Webmaster World, um, so local search forums, as well as very active on Twitter and other social media platforms, including the new um, Mastodon, I don't pronounce it. Um, so I'm, I'm really very, I'm looking everywhere, including the forums and, and um, you name it, everywhere. Some people email me stuff, but the majority of the stuff is me looking through different social media channels, finding new stuff um, okay. and keeping on top of stuff. Awesome. Let's uh, dive into it. So as you're probably aware, Google just published the uh, a guide to Google search ranking systems. Google uh, is becoming more and more forthcoming with information about algorithm updates, et cetera, et cetera. Do you quickly, if you don't mind, want to summarize that guide, you know, systems that are no longer active, you know, systems that are incorporated now into other systems? Just give us the, the rundown real quick, please. Yeah. Um, so Google just recently, you know, published a new document. And I'm sure, I think it was Danny Sullivan's doing with the help of Google's people. And Google, ever since Danny Sullivan got uh, involved in Google search. He's been trying to make things more transparent. Um, so it's great to have him there and to make things more transparent. Some of the things that Google documented that are no longer in use or have been incorporated in other algorithms is the Hummingbird algorithm, the mobile-friendly ranking system, page speed, uh, Panda, Penguin, and the secure sites. Um, most of those things either have been evolved in the core ranking system, like Panda and Penguin, um, mobile-friendliness, page speed, and secure site have been incorporated in the page experience update. Um, so there's all been incorporated into different elements. I think Hummingbird, I'm not sure if it was incorporated anywhere else, but it's probably been replaced by something else. Uh, but yeah, that's a quick recap of what's been replaced by Google or incorporated by Google in the core out in the search ranking system. Okay, cool. And I, I spoke about this in my presentation. So we, my, uh, our own website got hit by the early Google, the spam update. Uh, I think it was June 30th, uh, 2021. Traffic dropped by 80%. I didn't think we were spammers. Can you explain, like, what, how does Google define spam? I mean, definitely we were not spammers, but we had a ton of old content that, you know, I put up, like, 12 years ago. What, what is the spam update? I guess the definition of anything spam in Google's mind is anything done specifically to kind of... Um, uh, basically um, manipulate... Uh, Google search results. So spam would be done with the intent of trying to manipulate Google search results. It could be generating links, paying for links. It could be writing content in a certain way where you're trying to build Dory pages or even things like I'm generating thousands and thousands of pages trying to target certain keywords, but don't have enough, enough unique, unique content on that page. It's just generated, you're generating the content only to rank and search. Um, Google recently released the helpful content update, which is 
more about Google trying to say, hey, this content's written for humans, by humans uh, in a helpful way. Uh, but spam is really more, if you look at the spam guidelines, they're really more targeted towards um, techniques used by not just SEOs, but anybody to go ahead and try to manipulate Google search results in any, any way. And there's multiple ways that um, SEOs could do that. Um, and I'm surprised you were hit by the spam update. There's always, if you weren't spamming Google, not doing that. Um, but there are always, I guess, outliers. There are always cases of certain sites getting hit by something as false positive uh, when they really should not have been hit. So hopefully you recover from that um, without doing much effort. Uh, I don't know what you have to do to recover, but hopefully you recovered. <laughs> We actually completely redid the website. We killed, I would say, 80% of our content, which I have to say was terrible. You know, I wrote it like way back and was still up there. So we did recover and we, we, after Google launched, I forget the exact date, but man, we saw an increase back to the, the traffic that we used to have pre when we got hit. Okay, uh, so you mentioned the helpful content update um google has now they actually posted very strict i call them guidelines say if you publish content to your website we recommend follow these guidelines right like if you were to follow all of these guidelines i mean every piece of content on the web would be the best possible piece of content on the web my question to you and that that ties then into questions that are being posted here by our audience like how realistically how good has the content have to be like we cannot always publish the ultimate you know piece to everything like is it okay to sometimes publish just a blog post that's not that in depth yeah it's not about the being helpful is not about length or how deep it is or whatever obviously if you're writing something called the ultimate guide to whatever, that piece of content has to be incredibly thorough and deep. But if you're just writing something about a specific little niche topic on a niche topic that's very specific, like if I'm writing about Google did an update to the helpful content update, I don't have to cover the whole entire how to, you know, everything around the helpful content. I can just talk about that update. It all, it all depends on the user and if that content is satisfying what the user expects from that page. So it could be short content. It could be a few paragraphs. It doesn't have to be uh, the most detailed piece of content. But at the same time, if you're writing a piece of content that you want to rank for a very competitive keyword, you're probably going to have to look at the other pieces of content on the web and say, you know, why are those ranking? How do I rank above them? And usually it means you have to do something better. Google's purpose behind the helpful content update was for us writers to actually, or publishers or whatever, to write better content for the web. Their goal is not just to provide better search results, but to encourage us to actually write better content. I had had an interview with, uh, Google's HJ, uh, Kim, um, just a few weeks ago at XMX Next, or just a week ago, and he basically said that. He said, we don't just write these algorithms to, you know, make better search results, better quality search results and better, you know, rankings. Obviously, that's one of the aspects of it, but it's also to go ahead and encourage people to do better on the web. That came with the HTTPS update, that happened with Mobile Friendly, that happened with any of these core ranking algorithms or just to kind of encourage people to write better content, to make a better web so that Google has better content to rank. Yeah. So it's like a big circle. Completely agree. So that takes me to AI and content writing. So I spoke about this in my presentation, how we now look at every process in our SEO methodology. How can we use AI to basically assist that process, right? So I think a lot of writers out there, they are concerned that they're going to be replaced by AI. At least here at my shop, Old SEO Marketing, we are on a mission to hire as many writers, really good writers, as we can. Because AI writing is not there, and I don't think it'll be there for a long time. What's, what's, what, what do you see in the SEO world out there? Right. So it depends who you ask. If you ask an AI writing company, they say it's there. It, great, it does well. If you ask somebody who's not into AI, it's like it doesn't. I mean, ultimately, you want to make sure the content is something that the user wants to get. It has to be better. Now, could you use AI tools to assist with that? Maybe today, yes, probably. There are probably tools that can help make me or you a better writer. Um, it doesn't mean that it's writing the content from scratch. Some people say, oh, I'm going to go ahead and generate pages using AI and then tweak it but with a human. It's probably the other way, but today you probably wanna go the other way around. You probably wanna have somebody write the content from scratch and then have the AI tools maybe assist them, maybe bring in supplemental information that they can say, oh, right, this is a good piece of information I should include. 
maybe they drag it in and then tweak it. But at the same time, you probably want to have uh, the human writing the content for the human and then maybe have AI features, doesn't be whatever you want to call it, um, uh, machine learning features or other features like just regular algorithms trying to give you supplemental information that might be useful for the article. Um, so if you're writing about the helpful content update, maybe that tool looks for other things that people said about the helpful content update on social media or on other areas and lets you quickly go ahead and find that so that it can assist you with your content of the piece of content you're writing. But at the same time, I agree with you today, most AI stuff out there is not up to par in terms of just being able to generate content that Google wants to rank. Maybe you could go ahead, get ahead and get around it for certain types of queries and it might rank today. But in the future, Google, HA was clear. I mean, from his, Google's HA was very clear. It's like, he doesn't want that content to rank. He wants to have the most useful content. Um, and he doesn't want people just generating content by using machines or algorithms. I know John Mueller has always said in the past, like, yeah, it's possible um, to see AI doing all that work for you and being better than a human. But right now we're not at that place. Exactly. I mean, if you think about it, you know, I'm Swiss, I'm not a native English speaker, so I have to use Grammarly, right, to correct my things. This is how I think we use AI right now in the content creation space, but I think we're going to see massive improvements, you know, as AI improves uh, in the content writing space. Uh, let me see. On the way, a uh, question from Matthew. On the way to the search transformation, new SERP features are emerging like never before. Completely agree. And you report on them. Uh, which of them do you consider to be the most important game changers? Which ones are still missing for you, SERP features? Wow, that's a good question. There's yeah. so many SERP features I can't like, probably cover at least two a day <laughs> and then probably like 15 people or 25 people every day ask me, is this new? Um, but um, honestly, right now it's the shopping stuff. It's the product results. You see a lot of that for many queries. When you do a search, you're just inundated with like, it looks like you're going to a e-commerce site and scrolling through a category page. That's what Google's pushing big time. And then the supplemental stuff around that videos around products, images around products, short videos, so I think right now, if there's anything, especially because it's right before the holiday shopping season, products is where Google's all about, making sure they get your data from Search Console into Merchant Center, um, the way the products are listing, the product reviews update. It's all product focused. I mean, 2022 was the year of like products when it comes to Google search, in my opinion. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing right now. Well, on that note, and again, you report on that, uh, Google Search Console, Google just added the, uh, the shopping task tabs listing feature in search console can you summarize what this is all about so to me it's more about um, those who have a google search console might not have merchant center and it's just a very quick way for google to say hey you know you have google search console this is a very quick way to actually go ahead and push your structured data schema directly into merchant center so you can do it's a much streamlined process so you can get the data into search into merchant center um, it's just a way of google google getting more product data so they can compete with amazon and other um, e-commerce platforms cool uh the product reviews update that was a big one i think google is cracking down on fake reviews i mean a lot of people abused reviews right where do you see that going so the way i see it i think there's a new category created in the seo space there's going to be eventually professional product reviewers, right? That are legit, that you, somehow you're going to have to compensate them. What's, what's, what do you envision happening with the right. product reviews? Update? So there's a lot of confusion around the product reviews update. It's not about reviews being fake or having reviews on product listings. It has nothing to do with reviews on products or on services. It's about how a reviewer reviews a product. So you get the new iPhone, you have, a, you post a review about it. Every, you have hundreds of, of websites, thousands of websites product posting reviews about the new iPhone. Uh, you have tons of people on the videos doing videos of review iPhones. There's so much content out there about the new iPhone. Which one should Google rank? And Google has all these criteria around how, uh, what's the most helpful review out there. So Google has a whole spec around these are the things you should write. In short, Google wants you to be able to not just say, here's a new iPhone. These are the specs. This is how much it weighs. This is how fast the processor is. This is the camera. But also have the phone in your hand, compare it to other phones, compare it to Samsung, and, and really do a detailed review as a user would care about that device, uh, about that about that device and, or that product you're reviewing. So it's really focused around all this garbage content that people generate using merchant manufacturer data. Um, 
and that really, and we're trying to rank the best stuff above that. So, um, M MKMHB, all these, all these YouTubers really do a really good job. Uh, the unboxing guy, there's so much good stuff out there, um, around reviews. And now these affiliate sites that are generating these really low quality, you know, using AI to generate like specs and stuff, that stuff is not going to rank so well in the future. It's really about generating that really great content. And that's Google's goal around it. Cool. Before I'm going to ask you what you think was the most game changing Google search uh, ranking update of 2022 asked by Roberta. I'd love for you to quickly explain us. So Google, uh, the Panda algorithm update evolved into the Cody update. What's that? What's the, that's a brand new word I've never yeah. heard. Yeah. I, I was shocked. I was talking to HJ and he kept mentioning mention this name, Cody, Cody. I'm like, is he, is he misspeaking? <laughs> I've never heard of this thing. And then I had to stop. I'm like, can you just stop and just tell me what Cody is? And he basically is like, oh, you didn't know about that. Basically, Panda at some point, um, the code was so much, so much changed and it was replaced by another version of Panda, which they called the, which evolved and went to what they're calling into Cody, another black and white animal. Uh, either way, both those things are not used anymore. Anymore, they're built into the core ranking algorithm. So it's kind of just like a fun historical fact. Um, but um, it's just interesting to hear him say that, like we knew that was happening. That's one of the benefits of getting something like that on, on the channel. It's just um, something so much fun to, to listen to him about that. I know. So in your opinion, which one was the most game-changing algorithm update this year? So I thought it would be the helpful content update, and it wasn't. Um, I was really surprised. And I, I think that's going to be game-changing in maybe the next version. So I, I kind of want to put that in my pack pocket, saying the helpful content update was is going to be a big one next time it, it, it goes. Um, and the product reviews updates were pretty significant. Um, so it's hard to like say specifically which one was the biggest. I mean, sometimes these unconfirmed updates are, are pretty big, but I'm going to say the helpful content update is going to be a game changer. It's just not there yet. And I would say if we have another one by the end of the year, I think that is going to be like the algorithm that everybody's like the, the next Florida, the next Panda, the next Penguin will be the helpful content update. I just don't think it happened in a big way yet. And I think it will happen next time it happens. So I'm going to be predictive and say it's going to be in the future, the helpful content update. Awesome. Why don't we take a couple more questions uh, we're running at a time? sadly here so with more than 60 percent of uh, tiktok users being gen c younger users are now turning to tiktok and similar platforms instead of google for discovery purposes and i think even uh, google ceo talked about that right not too long ago how do you think this will change the way uh, marketers promote products uh, can tiktok be used to get an seo advantage so there's a lot of questions there. Um, so you do see Google kind of doing a lot more videos, shorts and stuff in the search results because the user who's searching for certain types of queries is the kind of user that goes to TikTok and watches advice from TikTok. I don't know if you've ever been on TikTok and listened to SEO advice on TikTok. It's horrible. <laughs> so it, it's pretty bad. I don't know what the advice on anything else in terms of TikTok advice is there, but it's out there. And that's what the, the younger generation consumes. They like video short form content. And I think Google has, you know, a, tried different things with different types of shorts in the search results. Can TikTok be used to take an, get an SEO advantage? I mean, it depends how you look at it in terms of publicity and generating traffic to your website um, to then generate potentially links in the, in the long run. Yes, but there is no direct impact with TikTok and an SEO advantage outside of just Google ranking TikTok videos in search or maybe getting some PR or some just general traffic to your website that could then translate to future mentions and links links to your website um so i wouldn't think seo is the next you know i'm sorry tiktok's the next seo thing that people are going to spam to get yeah. generate traffic talking about shorts and i heard you talk about this before when do you think google will kill web stories or like how long will web stories be around that's a good question uh, yeah i don't know it's i don't think they're, uh, yeah they'll probably kill it eventually um amp is almost dead web stories is still pretty powerful you still see them here and there pop up and they can generate so much traffic i don't know if you ever experimented with them even today you could pop a web story up on your site and if you haven't tried it try it because i would say if you try it 10 times one might generate crazy yeah. traffic would that traffic convert probably not uh but that stuff really um kind of climbs really quickly with the google discover results so if you have any discover visibility doing a web story or an amp story, whatever you want to call it these days, a visual story, um, those could actually generate a tremendous amount of traffic and you can repurpose a lot of your TikTok stuff or your Instagram stuff in a web story format. So 
I wouldn't uh, sell that out because right even today, they are doing very, very well, especially with Discover. Cool, cool. All right, one piece last of advice, anything anybody should follow before we wrap it up here? Um, in terms of SEO advice, it's, it's yeah. kind of cringy to say, but... Like, well, just, what, do you, again, what do you see in terms of algorithm updates in 2023? I mean, the trend, even for the, for the past 20 years, has been always about doing better than everybody else and making sure you make your users happy. Back 20 years ago, you were able to spam and jam it. Uh, today, you really need to do something that's above and beyond. Easier said than done, but really, if you're going to go ahead and do something, make sure you're doing it in a way that's above and beyond your competitors. And that really, really help your users who are reading that content or using that tool or service that you're providing. Awesome. Barry, thank you. This was short and sweet, but thank you so much on behalf of SE Ranking myself as well. Hopefully we'll get to talk again sometime soon. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your time. Make sure uh, our attendees follow Barry Schwartz. Yeah, you get the latest and greatest as it happens. Cool. Barry, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks, you too. Bye. All right. Um, I think we're nearly at the end of this awesome uh, online conference. I certainly learned a lot. I hope uh, our attendance audience as well. Uh, again, quick reminder about the giveaway. Uh, if you haven't already uh, post something about this online conference, make sure to tag uh, SE ranking then there's a ton of really good content more educational content on the se ranking uh youtube channel there's also the se ranking academy which is part of the the platform that i recommend if you're not that familiar with se uh, seo in general make sure to take that course uh, you can sign up for free right there then uh, we have a growing facebook community interact with your peers ask questions um, you know learn from fellow seo professionals yeah, with that being said, uh, there's going to be a Black Friday offer that you cannot resist. Uh, it's available right there, up to 36% discount on annual plans. Again, SE Ranking, it's, it's basically the only tool that we use here at Boulder SEO Marketing. Couldn't be happier with uh, this platform. And then three months uh, free access to the content marketing module, which recently was launched. It, this is a game changer. We use this platform on a daily basis. Highly recommend. Uh, check it out. Make it part of your SEO strategy. With that being said, um, we're going to post the videos probably by tomorrow. Uh, so everybody's going to get access to all the recordings. Uh, I think the slides as well of these sessions here. Then make sure to follow SE Ranking on uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Amazing, great content is being published on a daily basis. I would like to thank SE Ranking for uh, inviting me to host this online conference. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Love to do it again. Again, I hope uh, people learned new SEO related information. I would say, you know, stay safe and healthy and we'll see you again next time. Thank you so much for your interest in this uh, online conference. Be well. Thank you. Bye bye.